CLMP uh, Lake Manager. Uh, and um, you've probably been getting emails from me for a variety of, of parameters and updates, and you'll continue to get that through, through the, the summer months. And, you know, please don't hesitate. You know, you can write down our contacts because for aquatic plant mapping, you might run into a plant you're unsure of, and, and Joe and I are happy, truly happy to look at them and try to figure out what, what they are. Um, because it's, it's fun to get uh, pictures from lakes all around the, the state uh, and seeing what plants are in them. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, Joe Lattimore here. Um, I know a lot of you, but I don't know if I've met every single one of you. So um, I'm a faculty member at MSU uh, in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and also the director of the MyCore program. So both our lake monitoring and our stream monitoring programs and get to work with a really great team, including Eric and others you may know. Um, and so, you know, this is this is the, um, you know, kind of the most active or, or um, time intensive program of the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. So we're excited to see all of you here and ready to dive into um, plant monitoring this summer. Um, I, uh, a little bit more on me, I um, spent a lot of work um, doing outreach and also research on aquatic invasive species, particularly plants in our inland lakes, and um, do a lot of work on prevention as well. So um, helping local communities share information about invasive species with their neighbors and lake and stream users to help prevent their spread. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited when I get a chance to talk about our native plants um, that are, are beneficial and are doing well in a lot of our aquatic systems. So um, I look forward to working with all of you and, and including this training for the rest of this morning. And I, I'm guessing it'll come out, but uh, Joe and I uh, love aquatic plants and we, we work on them as much as we can. Uh, they're a really cool group of, of species out there. And Joe, I didn't realize, uh, could you record? I'm on it. It's already recording. Oh, it's recording. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Once we're, um, give us a, a few days and we will get the recording of this session posted to the MyCore website, along with all the recordings from all the other parameter trainings that we did um, a couple of weeks ago. Those are already up there. Okay, so the quick outline for the day, we have our content broken up into three chunks. We're going to have a, a quick introduction to aquatic plants, a little bit about, about them and, and why we care. And then we're going to jump into the protocol for aquatic plant mapping. So we get a sense of what's all um, of where to survey and how many rake tosses, all those sorts of things. And then we're going to jump into plant identification, where of course there are numerous plants out there that we won't be able to specifically tell you about each one of them. So we're hoping to give you a general background with some specifics that will, will help guide in your identification. The picture on the right is a flower, the beautiful flower of greater bladderwort. So uh, when I first saw this as a high schooler, before I knew anything about plants, I thought I was, I was out on my parents' wetland and I thought there were orchids growing in the out of the water because they're they're very orchid-like with the banner and the the lip coming out. Beautiful. So when we first peer below the water surface to look at aquatic plants, it becomes very apparent. It looks like we're looking at an underwater forest. It's incredible the amount of species that are intermingled amongst each other. And and, and, and it's beautiful, just like how we like walking in a forest, snorkeling amongst, amongst the aquatic plants is like a, a hike through, a hike through the, the woods. And so just some quick, fun trivia facts that you can take back to your family tonight at the dinner table is uh, there are 28 species of pondweeds in Michigan. And you know, we, we commonly hear about one pondweed. There's only one invasive pondweed in the state, and that's curly leaf pondweed. All other 27 of them are, are native. We have uh, a handful, 10 carnivorous submersed plants. And what that means is that we have plants that live under the water that have little contraptions that will suck in invertebrates and then digest them. 
So that's pretty cool. You know, we know of the Venus flytrap that sits in wetlands or the pitcher plant that sits in bogs, but these are actually uh, commonly found. That, that flower that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, that beautiful yellow flower, that, for example, is a carnivorous plant called bladderwort. And then, of course, milfoil. So that word has become like the, 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 a negative word, right? We hear milfoil and we hear bad things, but well, there's actually six native milfoils and then two of them are invasive. Now, one of them is very uncommon and is barely in the state uh, for an invasive species, but Eurasian water milfoil, of course, is the one that we're all probably aware of. And I hope some of you don't have in your lake. So aquatic plants live in the littoral zone of our lakes and the littoral zone is defined by that it's shallow enough that light may be able to penetrate to the bottom of the lake. And so when light can penetrate to the bottom of the lake, you can get rooted plants to grow. And so in Michigan, there's a we can be very generally speaking, we're looking at around 15 feet or under um, in clear lakes, it can go much deeper. In turbid lakes that are eutrophic, it could be much shallower. But in generally speaking, it can be around 15 feet and under is our littoral zone. And we can break up our aquatic plants by their broad community, which are the emergent plants, the floating plants, and submersed plants. We spend uh, most of our time uh, looking at our floating, which includes free floating plants like duckweeds and rooted floating plants like the water lilies and submersed plants. That's what we spend that's what aquatic plant mapping is made for is these species, this group, these communities. Um, the emergent plants we do touch on every once in a while because some of them can grow deeper in the water, but they're mostly wetland species that are up in very, very shallow water or on the fringes of the lake. And aquatic plant mapping is meant for, more, is meant for lake monitoring. So we... It's important to know about aquatic plants because they uh, have a lot of ecosystem functions and services, meaning they do a lot in a lake and some of the things that they do help us. And so here's one, for example, is that they, they absorb wave energy. So what we're seeing on the left side of this graphic is this is the surface of the lake. This is the bottom of the lake. And when there are wave energies, wave energy, this can be from um, wind generated waves, or it could be from a boat, um, although boats a little different, but there is wave energy that goes down into the water column. And this can scrape, depending on how deep the, the lake is at that point, can, can scrape against the bottom of the lake resuspending sediment. So when there are no plants on the bottom, you can get a lot of sediment resuspension. Sediment resuspension is normal, that happens in lakes, but what that also does is resuspend sediments that might have phosphorus that can, re, can release into the water column, which will then be available for algae. Um, it also clouds the water and just with the sediment itself. And what we see when there is a plant layer, like you see on the right-hand side, the wave energy is greatly reduced uh, near the bottom and you don't get much sediment resuspension. And instead, the, way the plants actually create pockets of lower wave energy and you get sediment deposition, um, which is a good thing. Plants also uh, create complex habitat near the sediment surface and then vertically as well. So there's a lot of structure associated with these plants um, where algae grow on. And because algae grow on them, you get grazers. And that's what we're seeing here. There's invertebrates that spend their time grazing along the surface of the plants, um, eating the algae that are growing on them. And then of course, you're going to get predators that are eating those invertebrates. And then also at some point in I, you, we could easily say all fish species in Michigan spend some time in the littoral zone during their life. Maybe it's for spawning, maybe it's for protection of their young, it could be for, uh, for predation, but they spend some time in the littoral zone and there is some interactions with plants there. 
And of course, these are plants, so they photosynthesize. And when we're in our warm waters near the shore, um, the, the oxygen produced by our plants are a key component of what's happening in these shallow areas. Something we may not think of as much is nutrient cycling. And so when, those, when these plants are growing, they are, um, they are using up nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients to build their bodies, and they hold them there. It's a sink is what we call it. So they're holding the nutrients in their bodies throughout the growing season until they die in the fall. Um, and so when they use up, when they're holding the nutrients, they're keeping it from other locations. For example, in the water column where algae may be able to use them. With the wave absorption, with the nutrient cycling, it can, you get some algal competition because uh, plants and algae are competing for light and nutrients, but specifically light. And so if there are, is too much algae, you don't get as much uh, plants. That's problematic. And so there are certain things that plants do. Some plants form canopies that create shady conditions that algae don't grow well in. Some plants produce chemicals that they emit into the water that inhibit algae, algal growth. And when putting it all together, you get, uh, especially in shallow lakes, I should note, you get better water quality. Um, plants are directly related to the quality of water in your lake, especially in shallow lakes. I don't want to, you know, there's other uh, benefits of, of plants and those are, they're beautiful. Um, if you put on a snorkeling mask and, and go for a swim amongst the plant bed, uh, you can see the wonders of that underwater forest and all of the, the organisms that, that live in it. And one more, um, just to mention that there is some evidence that if you have a healthy native plant community, it will um, resist invasion by a new invasive plant. So in this picture, for example, this is a native milfoil uh, as, a, as a growing tall. And underneath of that, this is all cara, which is a native macroalgae. And together you can see there's not much open space. And so um, it might be, what we're seeing is it might be difficult for something like Eurasian water milfoil, for example, to invade a plant community like this. So to kind of, to conclude this uh, portion of the presentation is that plants are really important. Um, we, they are under threat always because what do we call them? We say weeds, ew weeds, or, um, or we call them seaweed and we don't like them. We don't want them touching our feet. And so this means that there is an onslaught to remove them or treat them or reduce their abundance. And so, of course, in some circumstances, that's what management is. You, there's a give and take. So you may need to get your boat out. So to manage some plants there, that makes total sense. But what it would, our general recommendations would be to reduce disturbance and removal on aquatic plants because they're so uh, important um, and then enjoy them. Uh, Part of uh, lake living is aquatic plants and, and they're really cool. And uh, they become even more cool as you start to learn their names, just like everything. When you start to learn the birds around you, it's great to wake up in the morning and be like, ooh, that's a vireo, you know, and, and, it, and it adds to it. So thank you for this initial part. And now um, Joe is going to take over and discuss uh, the protocol. All right, and um, how does my screen share look, Eric? That looks good. And I, we, a question just popped in from Eric, and he asked, "What is the definition of a shallow lake? How shallow is shallow?" Um, shallow lakes are broadly defined as a lake that is what that doesn't stratify um, through the summer months, and so we call those polymictic. And so these lakes are what, what we mean by mixing uh, is warm water sits on top of cold water in deep lakes, but in shallow lakes, it's just not deep enough that, so then when wind comes through, it mixes it all up throughout the, the growing season. Typically, if we have to make like a, 
a depth range, it would be a lake that is 15 feet or less would be considered a shallow lake. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so again, keep the questions coming if you think of things. Um, uh, the chat is there to help you out and uh, you can always enter questions there and we'll keep an eye on that. So what I'm going to do now is actually get into the process of doing mapping. So we're gonna talk about the procedures now. So here's where we, we wanna pay close attention. Um, so uh, we talk about um, kind of the why behind doing it and then really kind of the nuts and bolts of the procedure. So um, the first thing to maybe talk about, and this kind of is a review of something that Eric just talked about is, is why is it important um, to understand the aquatic plants in your lake? And particularly why is it important to have a map of where those aquatic plants are and, and um, the area that they cover? Um, Eric just convinced you, I think, that plants are a beneficial part of a lake ecosystem, um, but they can be disturbed by a lot of different changes, both in the lake itself and also in the watershed. Um, if invasive species come in, um, they can outcompete our native aquatic plants um, and change, change that plant community, for example. Um, changes in the nutrient balance in your lake may favor certain plants over others. Obviously, if there is aquatic plant management happening in your lake, like harvesting or herbicide applications, um, physical removal of plants, um, that will change the aquatic plant community in your lake. So um, by creating, by doing what you've signed up to do this year, you're gonna create a map of the, lake, of the plants in your lake by species, and also have um, uh, some numbers behind that that show um, the relative lake-wide density of these different species. And that's an amazing basis for comparison um, over time. Um, if your lake has never been uh, subject to a plant survey before, um, you're going to really advance understanding of having a record that in 2022, this is what the plant community in our lake looked like. And if um, plant surveys have been done in your lake before, either through this program or by a consultant or through other programs, um, now you'll be able to compare what has changed over time, which is really fascinating as well. Um, so I've talked about some of the benefits of being part of this um, program, um, some other kind of uh, detail oriented benefits. Um, first of all, you know, everyone in the CLMP who's doing aquatic plant mapping is following the same procedure. So we can compare data from one lake to another, not only a single lake over time, but also different lakes across the state. So that's very interesting. Um, we provide this training um, both um, to this year online again, um, but we provide this training to you so you'll feel comfortable with what you're doing. Um, we also provide um, to our new participants, those of you who enrolled in the first year aquatic plant monitoring, um, a day of field assistance. We are actually going to work with you to schedule a time to come out to the lake with you um, to kind of get things underway. And we'll talk a, a bit more about that later on um, this morning. Um, while you're doing the program throughout this field season, um, we will provide you with any assistance that you need. Um, assistance with plant identification. Eric mentioned, you know, being able to send us um, pictures. You know, it's not unusual for us to receive, you know, a text with a, a photograph of a um, plant that people just aren't quite sure what it is. And sometimes if we happen to be at our computers, um, when that um, request comes in, we can respond very quickly. Um, we can help you um, with any questions you have about the actual procedures. Um, you know, how, how many sites should I be sampling? Um, should we be looking, you know, in the really deep parts of our lake? Those kinds of questions. We'll, we'll cover those today, but we'll also be available to answer questions because we know this is a lot of information all at once this morning. Um, we can also answer any questions that you have about how to report your data at the end of the season. So, um, you know, that's, we're here for you to, to help make this go as smoothly and easily and, and be as, as fun as possible for you. Um, all of the data at the end of the season, um, you will provide your final reports to us um, and we'll go through that here in a minute. Um, and those data also end up in the MyCore data exchange, which is great because that's our MyCore database where everything from SECI to phosphorus to plant data ends up and that's publicly available for posterity. Anyone will have access to that information. 
including the state. Um, obviously, we're an Eagle supported program uh, through the state of Michigan. And so they are very interested. Our biologists with Eagle and our lake um, scientists with Eagle are very interested to see um, the results of plant monitoring. So um, that, that's another benefit of participating in this program because there's a lot of lakes that just don't have this kind of data. Uh, I already mentioned that it's valuable um, as uh, a baseline information for future lake management. And I'll also mention a benefit is that although it's a fair amount of work on your part, um, it's really a pretty good deal um, compared to hiring a professional consultant to do a plant survey. Um, that can be quite expensive. And for first year in this program, um, the cost is $250, which is significantly more, we understand, than the other parameters in, in the um, CLMP. But I think you get a lot for your money as far as the support that you get, the one-on-one -on -one, you know, visit from us to, to your lake um, and so forth and support throughout the season. So um, we've actually been able to keep it pretty reasonable compared to other options for getting um, lake surveys done. Um, one thing that um, we do encourage our volunteers in this program to do is to make a plant collection. If we were in person, um, we would help you um, uh, do a little, a little craft project um, to actually take a pressed plant and mount it so you could keep it. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody kind of um, in the coming weeks or during the summer if you're interested in doing that. That. But, you know, our approach requires um, some pretty basic um, materials to do that, um, uh, taking a, a plant and pressing it. Some people have a, a, a technical plant press, but you can also use, you know, I often say you can also use a big phone book, but big phone books are hard to find these days, but like a big catalog or something like that to press um, examples of the different species of plants you find in your lake. And then once those are flattened and dried, um, you can actually just tape them to a piece of poster board, um, cover it with some clear contact paper that's adhesive and um, with a label for what it is. And that makes a nice collection of the different plants that you have, which are really nice, both for your own reference, but also to show your neighbors or people in your lake association what you mean when you say, you know, water celery. This is this is what I'm talking about. Here's an example of it from our lake. Um, more and more, we have you know really good books with great photographs and that kind of thing. But those include all the possible plants, not just the plants from your lake. So, so that's kind of a handy thing to do if you're interested. And again, we'd be happy to talk to you more about it um, offline if that's something you're interested in doing. So. Time to dive in, talk about the procedures, about what is actually growing in your lake. And, um, uh, you know, hopefully you can do this all from the safety of your boat and don't have to uh, dive in and get tangled up in, in plants like Howard here did. But, um, you know, let's let's dive in and see see what's in your lake. The most important um, kind of piece for this program is this publication. Um, it's uh, published by MSU Extension. It's called the Citizen's Guide for the Identification, Mapping, and Management of the Common Rooted Aquatic Plants of Michigan Lakes. Um, we have this as a PDF on the MyCore website um, under CLMP documents. That's the location where you can find all the data forms and procedures for all the CLMP um, programs that you may be involved with. Um, and so it's really handy to have it electronically. Also, for those of you who are uh, enrolled for the first time in this program, um, Eric's going to be sending out to you a hard copy of this book. So you'll have a copy, you know, a physical copy that you can and have in your hands. Um, it includes all the procedures, the data sheets we're going to look at here in a second that you can make print copies of. Um, it also includes a key to the common plants um, that we'll show you some examples of here in a minute. Um, so this is a, a real important guide. Um, uh, those of you in your first year, you'll also receive from, from, uh, from us in the next week or two um, uh, in your packet, not only this guide, but also um, instructions on how to build the sampling rake um, and some other supportive materials. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but we're going to go over a lot of that today. And if you want to look at and follow along with the electronic copy, again, that's available on the MyCore website. Um, maybe Eric can pop a link into the chat where people can find that. So this is the guide. Um, there, there are a couple of things that are maybe not the, the 
best about this book, one thing in particular, and that's because it was last updated in 2007. So a few of the new invasive species that we encounter in Michigan lakes are actually not in here because they weren't in our lakes in 2007. So we're going to also talk about a few other resources for invasive species identification um, that you can also um, look at. All right, so first thing that people want to know is where am I supposed to go in my lake? Where should I be looking for, for plants? And so the first thing that you want to do is get a map of your lake. Um, and that it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, maybe you have a lake map already, a paper lake map, um, or you can just simply pull something up online, look at Google Maps or some other thing like I've done here uh, for an example from Gull Lake. I've just pulled up um, the map that appears when you look for Gull Lake on Google. Um, and that, that'll work as well. So get out your lake map so you have a sense of, of what you're looking at for your lake. And then the first thing we encourage you to do is um, identify a few key locations on your lake. And those key locations are those places where invasive species are most likely to invade if they have invaded at all. And you wanna make sure you're sampling in those locations so you don't miss any potential invaders. Um, it's also valuable to look at these places and if you document that there are no invasive species, well, that's great too. So obviously the first one you probably think of, boat ramps. So if you have boat launches on your lake, you definitely wanna know where those are. And those can be you know, DNR ramps, but even private ramps, if you have a, a launch that your lake association um, uses or owns. Um, obviously watercraft are getting into the lake that way. So any boat ramps, private or, or public, are good to kind of mark on your map as you're getting started. Also look at other locations of public access, like public beaches and parks. Um, maybe someone, no one is able to back a motorboat in at those locations, but um, people may bring in kayaks or other carryable boats um, that way. Um, it may also be a location that if someone you know, made the mistake of um, disposing an aquarium into the lake, um, that may be where they would do that. So um, identify where those locations are, other public access sites. Also look for inlets. Um, here we have an example of an inlet stream coming into our example Gull Lake here. Um, that could also be a location where new species could come in from, from upstream. So identify those. And then finally, take a look at um, if there's any quiet bays or protected coves around your lake. Um, not because those are locations of potential introduction so much, but they definitely tend to be places of abundant plant growth. The plants are protected. They don't get a lot of wave or wind action in there. And so, um, you know, you're going to want to make sure you're surveying around those areas. So that is where we suggest that you, you begin by saying, yes, I'm going to sample at all of these important public access places and protective, protected coves. All right, now we're switching to a different um, example lake here, but um, again, what the person has done here is they've located their, their boat launch. They have one little inlet stream coming in over here. There's a beach over here that the public has access to. So you can see they've drawn on their map, but we're gonna call transects. And transect is a line that is perpendicular to shore going out um, in this case to about the 15 foot depth contour. Um, and so this is a transect here, number 14, number two and three are on either side of the boat launch, five and six are on either side of that public beach. Um, and then what we encourage you to do is then fill in between those locations. Um, so you have even coverage around the lake. So you've gotten those high risk areas and now fill in. So like seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, all of these are just relatively evenly spaced along the shoreline uh, going out to that 15 foot depth contour. And the reason that I say 15 feet is kind of the limit of your sampling, that's a rule of thumb. Um, it really depends on your lake. Um, and you'll have a sense once you get out and start sampling, like how far out do you have to go before you really aren't finding any more plants because it's so deep. On a clear lake, um, 15 feet or more may be that situation. If your lake is not very clear, um, you may be able to stop sampling at a shallower depth, maybe only eight feet. And after that, maybe there's plants, but the community doesn't change very much. 
Um, and so you, you can use your judgment on that, on, on how deep you wanna go out with your sampling. All right. The next question we get a lot, and we have a handy uh, rule of thumb here for you, is how many total transects should I be sampling? And here's a rule of thumb for you. It's in the, it's in the procedures, but I'm showing, to, uh, showing you it here as well. If your lake is less than 100 acres in surface area, um, five to 15 transects should be sufficient. Um, if your lake is 100 to 500 acres, the rule of thumb is 15 to 30. And if you have a large lake, a lake of over 500 acres in surface area, that's where you're gonna to wanna to have even more transects, 30 to 50. Um, we want definitely the, um, the number, obviously the larger the lake, the more transects you'll need to adequately sample the plant population. But we don't want you to try and do so many transects that the, the task becomes unreasonable. So um, this is a suggested number of transects that you can consider. And one kind of note that I'll mention um, about really large lakes, um, in some cases people actually decide um, because of the time that it takes um, to kind of spread their mapping effort across two seasons, this summer and next summer, for example. I don't know if any of you would be in that situation this year, but that's acceptable as well. Um, we've had large lakes say, okay, we'll, we've laid out our transects, but there's like 50 of them. Maybe we won't have time to get to all of them. So we're going to do every other one and do 25 of them this year. And then we'll do the other 25 next year. So if you start to feel like, you know, you get started and you think, oh man, this is going to take longer time than I have, um, that is an option for you. And, and you can always talk to us, uh, talk to Eric or I about that if you're trying to decide how to handle um, a big mapping project. Another note that I'll mention, um, if you have an island in your lake, um, do some sampling around the island. Um, this lake decided here will add transect 15 and 16 because often, of course, islands, even if they're out in the middle of the lake, they're shallow around them and there's often plants growing there and sometimes they're different than what is growing along your shoreline. So um, definitely add those. Um, I'm not guessing that you have a palm tree uh, with coconuts on your island, but I've seen a lot of things. So that might also be there. <laughs> But yes, if you have an island, sample around that as well. Let's dig in a little bit more about transects. So I've mentioned this already once, but I'll mention it again. And we've got a really nice example here, an aerial photo. Here's a boat launch. You recognize a parking area. There's a boat ramp right here. And our volunteer said, okay, we definitely want to sample right next to that boat launch to see if there's any invasive species. So they said, okay, um, here's the shoreline. And I'm going to draw my imaginary line going out to about 15 feet in depth in the lake because my lake's pretty clear and I can see that there's plants growing all along that way. Now, what we ask you to do in the procedures for this program is sample at three different depths along that transect. So in this case, they chose to do at about three feet of water, about eight feet of water, and about 15 feet of water. So when you're on the boat getting ready to sample, the first thing you would do is navigate to this three foot depth and you're gonna sample there. Then you'll move your boat out to eight feet and you're gonna sample there. And then you'll move out to about 15 feet and you're gonna sample there. And um, so it's helpful to have, um, really helpful to have some way of measuring lake depth when you're out on the lake. And I've seen all different ways to do this. Um, in shallow lakes, some people have a pole with the depths marked on it. Um, often um, a weighted line. So even um, I've seen people use their Secchi disc in the shallows, but it doesn't always work that great in the deeper water. You know, lower it down um, to see how deep you are. Your anchor rope on your boat, if you have an anchor rope, you can mark it with the depths and you can just lower it down to that anchor hits. You know, oh, I'm at 15 feet. I know I'm where I want to sample. So you'll want to have some way, um, maybe you have a depth finder on your boat if you're, if you're more high tech and the depth finder can help you with that. So at each of those locations, let's say, okay, we're ready. We found our three foot depth. Our boat is parked right there. The next question is how many um, times am I gonna toss my sampling rake? Which we'll look at in a minute. We want you to throw your sampling rake four times. So one off either, all four directions off your boat, north, south, east, and west. Um, and you're gonna toss it out there. You know, Don't throw your shoulder out, just give it a toss out onto the lake and let it sink and hit the bottom and then just drag it back. So those tines on the rake are gonna capture the plants and pull them back up to you. 
Um, so um, don't just drop the rake straight down, but also don't, again, throw your, throw your shoulder out trying to throw it so far out, you know, maybe, maybe eight to 10 feet off the boat is a, is a good rule of thumb. And then when you pull the rake up, then you're going to actually see what plants are there, identify them and record them on your data sheet, which you'll, we'll look at in a minute. A final question I get about sampling is what do I do with all the plants that I drag up? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, in most cases, you can, you know, toss them back into the lake. You could also um, bring a garbage bag along with you to, you know, fill them up and, and compost of them, uh, throw them on your garden or something um, back up on shore. Um, that's particularly important for invasive species. I'm guessing most of you, if you find pull invasive species out of your lake, you don't really want to throw it right back in. So it is a good idea to have a garbage bag on board, at least for any invasives that you pull up, just so you don't have to worry about it. Um, spreading around because you happen to pull it up. Um, it's also helpful to have Ziploc bags on board with you um, because there's a good chance you're going to collect at least a few plants that you're just not sure what they are. Um, and you want to spend a little more time looking at them, maybe looking at your identification guides to figure out what it is. Maybe you want to press it for your collection. Maybe you want to take some pictures of it. Um, and so um, those Ziploc bags are really helpful with a Sharpie marker. You can pop the plant in the Ziploc bag, write on it where you collected it from, and then you can later on shore um, spend some more time with that sample. All right, here's an example of what I'm talking about as the aquatic plant sampling rake um, and new folks to the program um, there are, and any of you, um, this is on our website, a copy of these instructions. We'll also mail them out to the new participants. Um, but this is one that you can build really, really simply. Um, you just take two inexpensive garden rakes, cut the handles off, clamp them back to back with a rope attached to them, and it works really well. Um, in general, for most lakes, you know, a, a rope about 20 to 25 feet long is, is enough. But if you think your lake is quite clear and you're going to be sampling in deeper water, you certainly can attach a longer, a longer rope to it. Um, we do recommend that you'll want to have um, some, see how the eye bolt is connected um, to wood that's in the handle. Um, talking to some folks who have bought very inexpensive rakes at their local hardware store because they're like, oh, I'm just going to cut the handle off anyway. Let's buy the cheapest one I can get. Some of those very cheap rakes don't have any wood in the handle. So um, to have a place to attach your eyeball, you either want to have a little bit nicer rake or, you know, make sure maybe leave a little bit of the handle attached before you cut it off. And then you can attach your eyeball to that handle. Okay. Um, of course, you'll want to be um, careful with this. Obviously, um, be careful while you're making the rake and while using it. Some rakes have kind of sharp teeth on them. Um, so, you know, just be careful with this. But um, this is exactly what professionals use to collect plants, too. We're not we're not cheaping out on you. Um, Eric and I both have our own, you know, favorite rakes that we use and we go out and do sampling as well. So um, this is this is the tool of the trade. All right, here's another example of um, what I said as far as how to throw the rake. Um, see the little boat that's parked out here? Um, after you park your, your boat, you're gonna wanna toss your rake at each kind of clock position um, and drag it around the lake bottom, haul the rake back to the boat, and then sort the collected plants um, while you're on the boat. Um, a couple of notes um, from experience um, from using rakes. There's a few kinds of plants that can be kind of hard um, to collect with a rake. One of those will be um, tiny little duckweed, the little water meal and such. You're going to see that in the second half of the training today when we talk about plant ID. Um, they float, they are, they often will not attach to a rake um, when you're, when you're dragging it. Um, but you will see them, right? So what we want you to do is make sure, you know, that you look around you. Don't just blindly look at what's on the rake and only record that. You may see plants floating. Another plant that floats is the invasive species, European frog bit. Um, it floats on the surface. It does not have roots that go to the bottom. So your rake may miss it. So you're gonna wanna keep your eye out on what might be floating around. Um, another thing that could challenge you is if you have heavy beds of vegetation, especially right along the shore, like a heavy bed of cattails, 
you might not want to throw the rake like into that bed of cattails because chances are it's going to get stuck and you're going to have to get out of the boat to retrieve it. So in those cases, again, you can do a visual assessment of, okay, if I threw the rake over here, what would I get? Um, and just include that. Um, another thing that could happen is sometimes the rake itself will get tangled in the rope. When you go to throw it, it'll flip around. And if that happens, um, just start over, bring it in, untangle it and, and toss again. Um, but there's also the chance that you'll throw the rake out and it literally doesn't get any plants, even though it's a, a legitimate throw. And that's perfectly fine. Sometimes there just aren't any plants there to get, especially in the deeper water, you may not be able to see. You'll throw it down there, the rake will sink, you'll pull it up, there's nothing on it. That's your data, zero plants collected. That's that's important to know as well. So oh. there are a couple questions that are relevant. If you sure, yeah, go ahead. Ask. These are regarding rakes. What is the purpose of the double-sided rake? Can you use a single? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and the problem is that if you have a single, it will depend on which way it lands on the lake bottom. If it lands tines up on the lake bottom, it may just flatten plants and not actually catch them. It would have to land tines down to really grab plants. So definitely you're going to want to have the two-sided rake to increase your chances of, of getting an accurate sample. Perfect. And one more. Can you use a purchased aquatic rake? We already have one of those. You can if it has teeth on both sides. Um, a lot of people, I know I have. Um, my mom lives on a, on a lake and um, she purchased a, a, a lake rake to kind of clear her little swimming area where the grandkids go and swim. Um, it's, it's quite wide. Um, the one I'm thinking of, it's like three feet wide or maybe even wider, and it only has tines on one side and it has a really long handle. So that can become very unwieldy for sampling. You try and fling it out there and the handle's six feet long and it hits you in the head as it's going out. Um, and it's really not comparable to sampling with a, a rake like the one I was just showing you. So it depends on what the, what the size and shape of your rake are, if, if it's really appropriate. If it's similar to what I showed you, um, then sure. But if it's not, then it might not be the best tool for the job. I can confirm we've done some testing with different rakes and I've thrown one of those big ones. And yes, your face gets really close to the rake handle. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want anyone hurting their face as part of this program. Okay, that's all for now. Okay, great. Let's move on. All right. The next step we're going to talk about, we're going to spend a little time on this, is how to actually record the data. Um, this is um, all the data sheets that I'm going to show you are actually in the book. That, that you'll be receiving, or you already have if you've done this with us before. Um, and you can use this, which is on page 51. Um, this is the um, data sheet you'll use, and you will use one copy of this for every sampling site. So for example, if you're at three feet at a transect, three feet of water depth, you need one sheet for that, for your four rate tosses. Then along that transect, when you move out to your next depth, bring out another copy of the data sheet for those four rake tosses. So for every transect, you'll have three data sheets, one for each of the three deaths. And so that's um, something you'll want to copy or print out several copies of this, depending on how many transects that you have. Okay, so first you'll fill in the general information in the upper left, lake name, county, the date of sampling, and the names of all the volunteers that are involved. Um, you'll also want to fill in the transect number. Maybe you're at your very first transect and you'd write number one there. You're also going to want to check what depth you're at. Now, these data sheets, it's already printed the depths of one foot, four foot, and eight foot. And that'll be appropriate for some lakes. But if your lake is really clear, you may want to adjust these a little bit. Um, the early example I showed was three feet, eight feet, and 15 feet. And you're welcome to, you know, scribble these out and put your own depths on there. You just want to be fairly consistent around your lake. Whatever you decide to do for your lake, um, be consistent about that. Okay. And then um, in the bottom box down here, this is where you will list the names of every plant that you found, every species that you found. Um, and you will check whether you collected it on the 12 o'clock rake toss, the three o'clock rake toss, the six o'clock rake toss, and or the nine o'clock rake toss. 
okay? Or you could call it north, south, east, and west, whatever you prefer, but that's what we're referring to is those four directional rake tosses you'll take off your boat. Um, and then the final thing you'll do, and you can even do this afterwards if you want to, you don't have to do this on the boat, is add a code for the density rating. And where do you get the density rating? Up here on the density rating chart. Um, if you found, let's say, coontail, I'm going to show several examples of this. So um, it'll, it'll all make sense shortly. If you found coontail, you'd write the name coontail in here. And let's say you only found it on your first toss, that 12 o'clock position. It was taken in one rate cast, then you would write F for found in here. And then the same as for if you found it in two of the four tossed, you'd write S for sparse. If you found it in three of the casts, you'd write M for moderate. If you wrote it, found it in all four of your rake tosses, you would write H for heavy in the density rating column. With the exception, if you found it in all four casts and the teeth of the rake were absolutely full, let's say you're sitting in a thick bed of Eurasian milfoil, there's no other plants in there, you can actually upgrade. Instead of just saying H for heavy, you could write a letter D for dense. That was all that was there. And that letter gets put in this um, column right here. So let's look at some examples. This is just the bottom. So we're saying we're at imaginary transect line number three on our lake. And we're sitting with our boat at eight foot in depth. And while we were out there, we tossed the rake four times, like we talked about, and we found two different species. We found stonewort and we found coontail. So write the names of those species in there. And what we see here is that our volunteer found stonewort in two of the four tosses and found coontail in all four. Okay, easy, right? That's easy to collect. And, and it's a good idea if you have enough people, and this is definitely best done with a team of folks, um, having one person whose job is recording. They'll have a clipboard with these data forms while the people who are going through the sample can say, I see stonewort, I see coontail, and they can jot these information, the information down on the data sheet. It's hard to juggle plants and writing on your data sheet if, if you can avoid it. So I just went through this aquatic uh, plant density rating um, description on the form. But again, if you found your plant just once, you'd write found, two is sparse, and so on. So now they've done that. Um, again, they found it stonewort in two out of the four tosses. So they wrote sparse. Coontail was found all in four. So they would write heavy, probably not dense, because as you can see, there was also stonewort in that, um, in that sheet, OK? Now, of course, if you can also make a judgment call, let's say that um, you found coontail in all four, but it was just like one little sprig. You found it all four times, but it was just a tiny amount, one little sad sprig in each of the rake tosses. You can adjust things like I did here. I changed it and I wrote moderate and I put a little asterisk there because they say, wait, moderate only means you know three out of the four. And then I made a note. I found it on all the rake throws, but only in minor amounts. And that will make it more accurate from your judgment. You're welcome to make those adjustments if you feel they're appropriate. All Did right. You, yes, go ahead. One question in regards to the transect line number. Mm -hmm. Is it, would it be helpful to have lat long associated with it as well? You certainly can, yes. And so um, we're going to look at some map examples here in a minute um, on how to how to show those. But yes, I definitely have um, plenty of examples, especially now that people have easy access to GPS, either through a handheld GPS unit, uh, a GPS unit that's on their boat or their phone, right, will often tell you the GPS coordinates. Um, yes, um, that can be really helpful. And you can just write that in the blank space on the data sheet. It's a great idea. All right, well, as you can imagine, um, you're gonna end up with a stack of those data forms since you do one for, you do three data forms for every transect that you do. So, you know, if even if you only had 15 transects for a small lake, you're gonna end up with 45 data sheets. And that's kind of hard to tell your neighbor, here, look at the results of our, our plant survey. Um, that's still just kind of raw data. And there's a couple of ways that we encourage you to kind of summarize the data when you're done with the survey. So a map is really helpful because it'll show a visual of the distribution of plant species around your lake. 
A table can be really ha handy because it'll show the list of species and their relative abundance. You can kind of sort them by the most abundant to the least abundant, for example, which is really helpful and useful and something that you can compare easily from a number standpoint from one year to the next. So we're going to show you how to do both of them. And first, um, one of the ways that we um, that you can choose to do that is again in the book, in the, in the citizen's guide, um, there's an example of um, numbers, basically codes for different types of plants that you may find in your lake. And so um, you can refer to this if you'd like, for example, um, and these are sorted by the way that they grow. So for example, low growing plants like stonewort, bushy pondweed, fern pondweed, um, we call it plant 20, 21, and 22. And that's kind of handy if you don't want to make a map and show what species, but you don't want to write out the long names of the plants. You can use this um, for that. Um, and this even has some additional information. As you can see, there's um, uh, pluses if it's a beneficial plant, zero if it's a neutral plant, minuses if it's sometimes a nuisance plant. Um, so that can give you some information there as well. So that's a way of using codes instead of using plant names. And this is helpful if you want to make a map legend like I'm gonna show you next. So let's say, here's an example. Um, you were out on transect number five and you sampled at the one foot, four foot and eight foot depth. And at one foot you found white water lily and it was sparse and you found stonewort and it was found. So one, uh, one uh, toss and two tosses is what those um, refer to if re you remember your density rating numbers. Um, then you have data from four feet. You found a few species there, data from eight feet, a little bit different community there. And so you can use those number codes for the plants to say, okay, a transect five, one foot, species 12, which is white water lily on that um, table that I showed you last slide, was sparse and 20, which is stonewort, was found. So see how you've just taken a bunch of really, um, you know, a lot of text and made it a, sm a much smaller code, which is something you can put on a map. Um, I understand this is a little hard to read. This is a very blown up image of a very old map, um, but it shows that information. Like here's transect three at one foot, species six was sparse, species 10 was found, species 13 was moderate and so on. So this is an example of how you can make your map. We don't require that you do this, but a lot of our um, volunteer lakes in the past have found this a really helpful way to visually summarize their data. Um, there's a lot of ways to make this map. Um, you can just write on a copy of a paper map like this volunteer did. Um, in this case, we're just showing their transect locations. Um, Google Maps is really um, pretty user friendly. This is an example. Um, here's Stony Lake in Oceana County. They've been monitoring plants in their lake for many years. Um, and they send us a link to their Google Map. And you can see here, um, you know, the name of the site. Um, this has the, the Latin long for it, um, what species they found using a code system and the dates that they found it. Um, so that's an option if you're comfortable using um, Google Map. There's also Google Earth if you want to upgrade a little bit more. Um, uh, again, if you're familiar with Google Earth already, feel free to make your map that way. If you've never used Google Earth before, um, you know, feel free to explore it, but um, it's not necessary. It's a little more technical than Google Maps, um, but it's another example. This is just another map that um, volunteers have shared with us for their, their lake and the work that they did on it. So those are some different examples of making, of making maps. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is making the data table. That's your total overall list of species and their lake-wide density rating. So this is, there's an example table on page 58 of the um, citizen's guide. And again, it's got summary information at the top about the lake name and when the sampling happens. Um, typically it will be for the whole lake. So you can just circle that number of transects that were surveyed, number of sampling sites, which is typically number of transects times three, because you'll do three dates um, or three locations on every transect. And then there's a place to add your lake name, number if you're using that, um, the number of sites where you found it and the average density. Um, and I'll show you how to calculate that. Um, 
and then other plants known to be in the lake but not collected. This is helpful because there certainly may be situations where you know there's a little bed of common bladderwort. You've seen it flowering, you went out and, and said, yeah, yeah, we've got common bladderwort, but it wasn't in any of your transects. This is the place where you would record that, just so it's recorded somewhere that, yeah, in 2022, we know that common bladderwort was in our lake, but we also know it didn't show up on any of our rakes. So it's, it's good to be able to record that here too. So we leave that there for a reminder. There is on page 57 in the book, there is an example on how to calculate the lake-wide density of your plants. And the lake-wide density for each species is actually what we're gonna have you enter into the microdata exchange. So it's important for you to calculate this. It'll also be included in your annual CLMP lake report at the end of the year. And it's really pretty easy. Um, so here's an example um, from the book where, um, and they're calculating for coontail because you'll calculate a rating for each species that you found. And so in this case, um, coontail was um, sampled for, it was found at 20 of the sites um, at the densities below. So along out of 45 places on 15 um, transects, so 15 times three is 45, remember? Um, so 15 transects on the lake sampled 45 sites, and they found it in a total of, it looks like 19 sites, not 20. Um, and, and two of those sites it was found, so it was on one rake out of the four. And 10 of the sites it was sparse, it was on two lakes out of the four, or out of the, the lake, and so forth. And it goes on through there. And then you'll just multiply, remember found was on one rake, so it gets two points. Two times one is two. It was found 10 places, it's sparse, so times that by two. So that gives it 20 points. It was found at three sites or two sites at moderate. So times that by three equals six. And fear not, you don't have to memorize this. It's in the book. And once you do it once or twice, this will be really easy for you. In fact, I've set up a little Excel spreadsheet that calculates it for me. Um, and you go through and do all that. So you finally calculate your number of density points. The total number is 50. So that's how many density points Coontail earned in your lake. And you just divide that 50 by the number of sampling sites, 45, and the answer shows you that coontail gets a lake-wide density rating of 1.1. Um, that's slightly above found, so it's fairly low density. Um, you find it at about one out of four rake tosses across the lake. So you would record that on the data sheet like this. This is the data sheet I just showed you, just zoomed in. So here's coontail, it's plant number 41 on our plant list, plant name is coontail. We saw it on 20 sites and the average density was 1.1. I threw in another example of stonewort. I didn't show you the calculation. It came out at 0 0.9. So it's a little less common than coontail across your lake. Um, and here I also added, oh, I also found water weed. I know it's in the lake, but we didn't get it on any of our rakes. So that calculation will give you a really nice list when you're done of every species that was in your lake and their average density. And you can sort that from like most dense to least dense. So you can easily tell your next door neighbor or your lake association, you know, coontail is the most abundant plant in our lake. It's rated 1.1. Stonewort is the second most abundant plant in our lake. It's rated 0.9 and on down the list. And that will show up in the MyCore data exchange as well. All right. So, some other helpful hints for your protocol. Um, one of them is plant identification photography. Um, taking good pictures is so helpful. And so, um, and now that we all have a phone that can take high quality photos, um, we really encourage you to do that. It'll be helpful for you. It will also be helpful for us um, to confirm the accuracy of your identifications. So um, at minimum, we definitely want to ensure that you take a photograph of any invasive species that you found. So here's an example of a photo I took of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, if you are new to the program, we'll provide you with one of these laminated sheets that has a scale on it, little rulers. So it's easy to see in a photo how, how large the plant actually is. Um, it's important to label the photos. In this case, I did not label the location um, of, the pic of the plant, but you should um, when you're out there. Um, so you say, oh, this was Eurasian milfoil and I found it at transect three, 
at one foot of depth, for example. And what I've done here, what you can see what I've written on here, because it's laminated, I use a dry erase marker. I can write on it. And then when I'm done, I just wipe it off with a towel and I can start fresh and label the next plant that I'm photographing. So that works out really nicely. Um, you wanna make sure that your photos are clear, um, blurry photos, photos out of focus, photos of plants all wadded up where you can't really see any of their features are not useful and you'll regret them later um, because they're not, they're not helpful. Um, you need to show identifying characters. So here in this picture, you can see, I took a, a whirl of leaves and spread it out. So you can really see the high number of leaflets there that's characteristic of Eurasian milfoil. And then I also include um, the whole plant. So it's easy to see um, the leaf arrangement and, and the size and shape of it. So take good photos, um, especially, and when you're sending in your reports to us, um, photos of at least your invasive species are required. If you have other, if you took pictures you wanna share of your native plants, we encourage that as well. And you can send that all to us electronically. You don't have to print them all out. Again, reminding you that using this photography card, the laminate is really, really convenient and handy because it has a scale right on there and it has a nice white background. Um, but if you happen to not have a, a sheet like that, actually um, taking the photo with your hand in it is helpful too, because it gives a really good sense of the scale. Um, it helps us see just how big it is, because sometimes if it's just some green plant material, we can't tell if it's a tiny little moss or a big leafy plant because there's no sense of scale. So um, a hand will work in a pinch. All right. Next step is what do you do when you're all done? You're ready to submit your data. Um, so we want to for sure make sure you have a copy of everything. Don't send us your only copy of anything because this data is for you. We want it too, but really it's for you. This is a helpful, um, you know, you put a lot of work into this. This is for you. So don't, um, don't send us the only copy of anything that you have, photos or data forms, maps, and so forth. Make sure you have copies. Um, we want you to enter the data into the MyCore Data Exchange on the website by October 31st. You can do it before that, um, but definitely do it by October 31st. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, what you'll be entering is, you know, the basic lake information, dates, who was out there sampling, and then that calculation of the lake-wide density for your species list. That's what you'll be asked to um, enter into the data into the database. Send your complete report report to us. And that includes um, your, your data sheets, your map, any photographs you want to share. And you can send those to us hard copy in the snail mail. You can email them to us, um, you know, whatever is most convenient for you. Um, you know, we don't expect you if you took 50 photographs to print all 50 photos. In fact, having them digitally is actually easier for us because we can zoom in and, and look at the details. So, you know, feel free to just email them to us, um, um, scan them, take a photo of your data sheets, whatever is easiest for you. But we do want all that by the end of October. All right, um, so that's the process. Um, obviously having some good um, resources out there to help you identify your plants is, is really valuable. Um, I mentioned the, the book that everybody receives from us and I'll, I'm gonna swing back to that in a minute, but I wanted to mention a couple other ones as well. Um, we can also provide you with a copy of um, the extension publication called A Michigan Boater's Guide to Selected Invasive Aquatic Plants. It's a nice little spiral bound um, guide to invasive species. And this includes the invasives that are not in the older 2007 publication. Um, things like hydrilla and European frog bit that you're, you're going to get to see a lot of photos of later this morning. Um, if It includes those and, and even some that aren't known in Michigan yet but we want people to be aware of in case they happen to find them. Um, there is also a PDF of this on the CLMP webpage with all the other documentation for this project. Um, and if you are interested in getting lots of copies of this, um, maybe I'll, you want to give a copy to everybody on your lake, um, you can actually co uh, purchase copies of it um, through the MSU Extension Bookstore, which is shop.msu.edu. 
We are also excited about a couple of publications from our neighbors in Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin Extension Lakes Program has two really nice books um, that Eric and I keep close at hand all summer long, um, and we recommend them highly to other folks as well. Um, one of them is called Through the Looking Glass. It um, is a really nice kind of um, description of a lot of the plants that you will find in your lakes. Um, it has line drawings that show all the important features and also has some really interesting text about each of the plants, their ecology, what eats them, what role they play, kind of interesting, curious things about those plants. Um, there's even aquatic plant poetry in this book. So it's a really nice guide to kind of keep back at your cottage or at your house um, to learn more about plants and to confirm the identifications. And um, I've got the link there for the um, Extension Lakes uh, program. You can click on the bookstore link and it'll show you where to get it there. Um, I think it's also available on Amazon. And the other um, book um, that we rely on a lot and really uh, enjoy is The Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest. Um, also from University of Wisconsin Extension. Um, this one's a little more costly, but it is a beautiful photographic guide of our aquatic plants. And so there's a multiple excellent photographs of every species you will find, and then some. Um, it's spiral bound, it has some uh, keys to identify, and we'll look at some keys here in a minute uh, for most of the major groups. And um, this is a really great reference. Um, it's gone through several editions. Some of you may have an older edition of it. It hasn't changed a whole lot, um, but this is another really nice guide. And, and this one's probably my favorite. All right, so this, we're gonna look back at um, the key now that's included in the citizen's guide. So I'm assuming many of you have used a dichotomous key before, maybe in a biology class or something, but it may have been a while, so we're going to walk through this. But basically what it is, and it's included in this citizen's guide, is a um, series of questions that it will ask you about the plant you're trying to identify. And there's always two choices. It's either A or B. One or two is the, um, you have to choose which one applies to your plant. And that's why it's called a dichotomous key because there's two choices at every step of keying out the plant. And this is included in the citizen's guide. But the first thing you have to do, if you are on page 13 of the guide, um, the first thing that there is, is a place for you to decide which part of the key you need to use. So there's parts one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So first you wanna say, okay, I have a plant in my hand and I need to decide which part of the key I want to look at. So if you take a look here on the slide, what you can see is that the key is divided into parts based on how the plant grows in the lake. So parts one, two, and three are for plants that grow on or above the water surface. So that includes free floating plants that are small, less than a half inch in size. So that's things like duckweed and water meal. You'd go to part one if that was the plant you had in front of you. If your plant had leaves that extended above the water, think cattails, think reeds, um, you would go to part two. If your plant has floating leaves, like a large leaf that floats on the surface of the water, you would go to part three. That's things like your lily pads, right? And then the remaining parts are for plants that grow entirely below the surface of the water with a possible exception of a small flower or something that just pokes above the surface just a little bit. Um, if it's mostly a submerged plant, then you're gonna look into these parts. And there it's divided by leaf shape. So if the leaf is thread or needle-like, super narrow, almost stringy, you'd use part four. If the plant leaves are long and ribbon-like, you'd go to part five. If the plant's leaves are complex and finely divided, and you'll see examples of those, like a milfoil, you'd go to part six. And finally, if the plant's leaves are oval or oblong or lanceolate, means like a lance, like an arrowhead, you'd go to part seven. So that's the first thing that you'll do. And then you get to the actual key. So let's go through an example together. Here's our plant. You're back, you're sitting on the boat and you've got your key, you've got a little time. So you're like, I'm gonna figure out what this plant is. I've got my key. 
here's this plant and I don't know what it is. And I need to decide by using the key what kind of plant it is. So the first thing you have to do is decide which part of the key you should go to. And I have to give you a little bit of information that you might not be able to tell from the photo is that the plant is completely submerged below the surface. It does not extend above, okay? So as we look back to um, our, our list of parts, um, of course, it's always harder to tell from a photo than from a real plant, but this plant would be in part five, plants with long ribbon-like leaves that grow below the water surface. So to continue identification, we know we need to go to part five, which is on page 23 of the book. So let's, in our imaginations, flip to page 23. So here we are in page 23, and now we have the dichotomous key. So the key is, um, requires you to choose between two alternatives, and each choice will direct you to the next set of alternatives to evaluate. So, um, and there are drawings that go along with the key, so that can help you answer the question. So you always start at number one, and let's just look at the structure of this. It's going to tell you, choose one of the following, and there's two descriptions. Here's the first description, here's the second description. Something you'll see here is figure and plate. Figure is referring you to drawings in the book, drawing 3.31. Plate is referring you to some of the color photographs in the book. So you read all leaves arising from the base of the plant and you can see examples of that characteristic in figure 3.31 and on plate number two. Another thing we'll see as we look at this example is that it's telling us the name of a plant. What that means is you've already got your answer. If this was the case, if the plant you were looking at had all the leaves arising from the base of the plant and it looks like the plant in these figures and plates, you have your answer. It's Vallisneria americana, wild celery. And then follow the dotted line, it tells you see portrait 34. In the book, a portrait is a description of Vallisneria americana in this example. Portrait 34 will tell you about wild celery. However, if your plant does not fit this description, you'd want to look at the second choice. And in this case, it says leaves arising from a stem. And it shows you, if you want to look at examples of leaves arising from a stem, you'd go to these figures, 3.32, 3.4, and 3.5. And if that was the case, you'd follow the dotted line and it tells you to go to step number two, which is here. And you'll just continue that in a stepwise fashion through um, the questions till you find your answer, either wild celery or something else in this key. So, you know, take some time um, right now, as I've been talking, you've probably been reading ahead um, to look at the um, features of the plant. Um, as I mentioned to you, this plant, we already know the plant grows completely below the surface. I also need to tell you the plant has a round stem. So if that's something that um, you need to know, does the plant have a round stem? It does. That's important in step number two. Another thing I have to tell you is that the leaves of the plant, and you'd be able to tell this if you had the plant in your hand, the leaves extend in many directions from the stem, not just in a single plane. So that's what we run into in step three. In number three, you'll need to know that. All right, you can take some time and read through. Looking at the photo may help you answer some of the, uh, the questions. And some of you may have seen this plant before and just know what it is. All right, it's time for the big reveal. All right, so the first thing you do is you go to number one. Um, do the leaves arise from the base of the plant or do they come from a stem? They come from a stem, right? You can easily see that. So then we go to number two. Is the stem flat or is the stem round? Well, I told you the stem was round. And if you had the plant in your hand, you could roll the stem between your fingers and you'd know that. So we know our next step is to go to step number three. All right. In number three, it asks us if the leaves are extending in opposite directions in a single plane or are they scattered and, and coming out in many directions? We know that they're coming out in many directions. That takes us to number four. So we go to step four and it asks us if the leaves are short, less than four inches long, 
and the leaf margins are finely toothed. Well, hopefully you saw that indeed there are teeth on the sides of the plant that was pretty clear in the photos. So now we know we're looking at Potamogeton crispus curly leaf pondweed. That's an invasive species. Um, and if we wanted to learn more, we could see portrait 51 in the book and it would tell us more about curly leaf pond. And that's the process, um, going through the key, um, learning um, what plants you have. Again, those other resources are great backups. Um, the uh, Guide to Plants of the Upper Midwest has amazing photographs in it. Um, through the Looking Glass has excellent drawings and descriptions of the plants. And the um, Boater's Guide to Invasives has some of the recent and uh, ri um, high risk invasive plants in it. So um, that's a great set of, of books to have. All right, the final thing that I wanted to mention that I was going to get back to was the idea of field visits. Um, if this is your first time doing aquatic plant mapping, you are eligible for a field visit from myself and or Eric um, to come out to your lake this summer to help you get your survey underway. Um, when we do these visits, um, which we'll schedule with each of you individually after this week, we'll reach out to you each individually. Um, We'll pick a day that works well for you. Um, and if there's other folks on your lake that are interested in helping out, they're of course welcome to join as well. And we use the day um, in whatever way is most beneficial to you. Uh, a, a common you know, day at the lake for me when I do these side-by-sides is, you know, we'll meet at the lake, you know, at your place or, or wherever you're comfortable. Um, we'll talk about your sampling, um, approach. At that point, you probably have already looked at your lake map and maybe drawn out some transects and, and want to say, okay, here's where I'm thinking of sampling. Does this look good to you? We'll talk about it. Um, typically, people have done a great job, but we may have some ideas for you about places to sample on your lake. Um, we'll answer any questions you have about um, the process. And then we'll spend some time actually out on the on the water. Um, let's go sampling. Let's get started. Let's sample some, some um, sites on your lake. We'll look at the plants. We'll talk about identification. Um, you know, we usually, um, we never get the whole survey done that day, but we certainly can get you going. Um, maybe you've already done a little bit of sampling and that's fine too. Um, but we try and do it before you've, you know, obviously before you've finished the sampling. Um, we usually will bop around to different parts of the lake where you think there might be some different types of plants growing. So, you know, you can get some practice identifying them with us and we can help you along with that and so forth. So um, we'll be reaching out to all of the, the new volunteers for aquatic plant mapping um, that we haven't done a side-by-side -side with um, to schedule that in the next week or two. All right, I think we have time for questions now, Eric. Is there any more questions that have come up? Nothing yet, but I'd encourage folks to ask away you answered one that was asked regarding the timing of, of when will we know when will they know about the uh, possible dates for mm -hmm. side by sides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and be thinking about that yourself. You know, when we reach out to you, you'll, you'll get an email or phone call from us. And um, you know, we have some dates in mind that we know will work for us, but also think for you, what's going to work for you, um, especially if you have more than one person who wants to participate in that visit, um, you know, coordinate with them to get some ideas and, and we'll work together to figure out a time that works for all of us. And we usually do want to schedule a, a rain date as well, because it's no good to try and go out on the lake if there's a thunderstorm in sight. So um, it's good. We usually will put a date, um, a, a primary day and a rain date on the calendar. So we have that backup scheduled. For sure. Joe, can you put up the rake slide again? You bet. I'll flip back. And Molly, I did put the link that goes to the MyCore website for that sampling rake as well, that PDF. I'll Ooh, there it put it in again. So yeah, there's the rake. Um, but yeah, there's this, this is just an image of the, um, instructions that we have on the um, MyCore website. So you can see them there, or print them off there as well. And I've used, you know, when you look at this, like those C bolts, I've also used those small hose clamps there as well. And that works nicely. If the rakes are kind of oddly shaped together, like they don't form nicely, I found those, those hose clamps will work nicely at pinching it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Ralph asks, is the citizen, citizen's guide provided to those enrolled in this program? If so, will it be sent to the participants? Yep, that's exactly right. Um, everybody who's new to the program, if you've done this before, you, are, you should already have a copy. If you don't, let us know. Um, but yes, you'll get a packet in the mail with, um, with the citizen's guide and some other supporting materials. Are there any other questions? And as I mentioned before too about that, it's it's in PDF format on our website as well. So that's a really easy way if you wanna just print out the data forms, you can just go to that page in the PDF and print however many copies you need. Um, or you can take the hard copy to a copy machine and do it that way, but the PDF makes printing out copies pretty easy. And there's the link again for the citizen's guide. I love dichotomous keys because it's like the um, choose your own adventure, I think is what it was called. There's yes. like books where you would choose your own adventure going through. Anyways. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, here, Eric has a question. How spread out through the summer do you schedule the visit? So we usually try and do them sooner rather than later in the summer, um, just so, you know, we get out there when you're just getting ready to start your sampling. Um, so again, we work it with you, but you know, I know I've already got one on the books for early August because the group is returning. They've done it before, but they want you know some extra support. So we can do them later in the summer, but you know, it really depends on what's going to work for you. Um, we can do them in June, in July, early August. Um, we've got some time available across the summer. Okay, well. Thanks, Joe. That was great. And now, uh, because we've been sitting for an hour and a half or so, it's great to have a 15-minute break. So let's let's begin that break um, before we transition to our next part of our uh, presentation, which is a, going into plant identification. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from the break. I hope you were able to get on, uh, walk around and stretch your legs, get another coffee. And now we're getting into the, the next part of our, uh, our presentation, which is now heavy on aquatic plant identification. So this, this first part that I'm going to present on is, um, is to familiarize everyone with certain plant parts. There is there is some jargon when we learn uh, uh, when we learn about plants, and so I'll cover some of the common um, words that we'll need to know to better understand what we what we're seeing. Um, but like like all plants, it, you we we use kind of the same. Uh, structures as we do on trees, on, on our flowers in our gardens. We look at the leaf, the shape of the leaf, um, the base of the leaf. You know, does, is it heart-shaped? Um, is it not? Is the tip pointy or is it rounded? We oftentimes will look at the edge of the leaf or the leaf margin. So that's the edge of the leaf. And we'll say, does it have teeth? If it has teeth, what kind of teeth are they? Um, we, uh, on, on aquatic plants, this leaf-like structure called a stipule is really important for the identification of pond weeds. And um, also the leaf stock or petiole, so that's the same thing. Um, is there one? Um, how long is it? Um, where where is it in a proximity to other leaves? So so this is generally what we look at. We use all of these terms together to get to what plant we're we're looking at. Now, in a lot of our plants, we recognize them by the flower, and that's how they're arranged. Even we we look at how many petals. Uh, we look at the reproductive parts, the male and female uh, parts of the flower, to determine what species it is. But in aquatic plants, we rarely use um, flowers. And that's because some, some plants rarely flower. Um, I've been doing aquatic plant work for over 10 years. And I have only seen this plant, Elodea, flower once. Uh, and I was super excited for it. 
but only once. And this is a very common plant I've seen thousands of times, but only flowering once. So we use what we say are called vegetative features and not the flowers. And so vegetative features are the stem and the leaves, maybe the roots and the rhizomes. So now we're going to walk through a lot of those, um, those uh, uh, vegetative parts um, to help familiarize how we can uh, uh, ID these plants. So we first are looking at what kind of leaf do we have? And so there are simple leaves. You can think of this kind of like an oak tree where uh, there's one leaf coming out of the twig or we have finely divided leaves. And so in the terrestrial world, we call that compound leaves. You can think of this as an ash leaf. So what that means is if the twig is where my cursor is right here, this is the whole leaf. And then these leaf structures are called leaflets. And you can see that here on our Eurasian water milfoil. Um, here's the stem. Here's a full leaf, and that leaf kind of looks like a Christmas tree kind of thing, or a fern. And then each one of these appendages are called leaflets. And so you'd ask yourself, do I have a finely divided leaf or do I have a simple leaf? Now, finely divided leaves can come in many different forms, not just looking like a milfoil leaf. Some are forked, and you can see here where this is one leaf right here and it's forking or creating a peace sign um, or a wishbone is another way to look at it. We have our feather-like or Christmas tree-like leaf right here in the milfoils. And then we have a more of what we consider branched. So this is an entire leaf. The stem would be right here. And these are, it, this is a leaf that's branching. So forking many times. Now, something to note, so this forking many times is common on bladderworts, um, and something specific to bladderworts is that you get these cool um, structures, which are the parts that suck in the invertebrates and then slowly dissolve them. So these are the, these are the bladders, and that's helpful for identification. So going into the... Um, forking a little bit more, sometimes you're asked to count how many times it's forking. And so this is one leaf again, and it would be considered forking once. So there's one wishbone. But now, when we look at this one, so here's the stem, there's a cross section. You can see it forks once here, then it forks again. And from that fork, it's forking again. So this is forking three times. And this is getting more into what we would be considered branched. This, these two are, are what we call coontail. And there's two species of coontail, one being very common and one where it's like this, which is uh, much less common. Okay, moving on to leaf margin. So when it asks you leaf margin, that's asking you the edge of the leaf. So oftentimes we're saying, is their teeth. And you can see on this one that it's smooth. And so many of our um, simple leaves are smooth. And when they have teeth, that becomes a little more unique and you can use that as a feature for identification. So as we learned when Joe walked through the curly leaf pondweed um, uh, example with the dichotomous key, you saw that there's teeth there and they're very obvious. Curly leaf pondweed is the only pondweed with teeth up and down the leaf edge or the leaf margin. Now, of course, there's other types of teeth and the description can help identify. And so this is an example of a margin that is lobed. And so you can see here where there's a big deep cut in to the leaf and that's considered a lobe that we see on our water lilies. Probably the most important um, general character that we use right away is leaf arrangement. And here are the four most common leaf arrangements, although there are a couple more. And so uh, usually when I'm in person, I stand up and say my, my body is the, is the stem and then I have a, 
a leaf coming out one way down here and then the leaf coming out this way. And that is what would be considered alternate leaf arrangement. And then opposite uh, arrangement would be a leaf here and then the leaf coming out the other side and that's considered um, opposite leaf arrangement. And then world, which I can't do with my hands, um, would be that there are more than two leaves coming out of the same node area in a world pattern. Now there is also uh, another called basal and this is where leaves are all originating from one point. Most of the time that point is coming from the sediment surface. And so this is an example, of the common one, water celery or vallicinaria or eelgrass. All of those are the same plant, just with different names. Um, so all leaves coming from one location, usually at the sediment surface. Now there are, there's another one that we see in a milfoil species that's more scattered. And so it is nor it's world, but now imagine if the leaves were just kind of coming out in a more random pattern and that would be considered scattered. So leaf arrangement, really important, usually really easy to tell. So this is a great character um, to look for. Leaf attachment is also great, uh, a great character. So we have clasping, we have sessile, and then we have stocked or has a petiole. So I'll go through these each. So here's kind of the classic one because we can think of it as an oak leaf has that little appendage that comes out of the bottom and attaches to the twig that's called the petiole. So the question is, does the plant have a petiole? And then you would say, yes, indeed. Um, and then it might ask how long is that petiole and that'll help you uh, understand which species you have. Now, this is what it looks like when there is no petiole, and this is called sessile. So the leaf is attached directly to the stem. Um, it's like it's, uh, you'll, I'll give this now in, with clasping, it's sessile is like um, the leaf is chest bust bumping the stem. And so it's not hugging it, um, but just coming in contact without a petiole. Whereas clasping, is now the leaf is giving the stem a hug. Um, as you can see, this one is right up against it and this one is actually wrapping around it. There are a couple species of pondweeds that are clasping. And so that's, it's really a nice character to quickly see and be able to diagnose to, your, to the species that you're um, trying to ID. Sometimes we're asked to count the number of veins for again, again, this is a great example between Illinois pondweed, a common pondweed, and another common pondweed, variable leaf pondweed. And so what does it mean to count the veins? And so you count the very faint ones, as you can see right here. And then you count also the more prominent ones. So you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, so you go eight and eight. So that's what we're doing here. So eight of the veins on each side, and then you also count the mid veins. So you have 17 total veins on this particular leaf. So make sure you count the faint veins and also count the mid vein. So now I'm gonna go through a some other features um, that are associated with our submersed plants. And that's the mid vein. So you've heard me talk about it already. Uh, that's important because the question comes up, comes up saying, is there a mid vein or not? And so mid veins are usually these very prominent veins that are in the center of the leaf. Um, sometimes they're different colors, sometimes not. You can sometimes feel them because there's actually a ridge there. And you can see these are now the lateral veins coming off of the mid vein. You also might be asked to look at the apex of the leaf. And so you will be asked, is it pointy? Is it rounded? A word for rounded could be obtuse. Um, and all of those help. This one is a leaf apex that has little spines on it. And that's helpful for ID as well. When we look at leaf blades, so now if we're holding a, a, a plant and we're holding the leaf and we've looked at all these different features, but now we wanna look at the venation so that what the leaf looks like. Oftentimes what I do is I will point it up at the sky, not the sun, because we're not trying to be blind, but point it up towards the sky and it'll the light will shine through that. 
and through the leaf. And so you'll get a sense of what the vein pattern looks like. Some of them like submersed buried, it looks like bricks have been laid down and it looks like you're looking at a brick wall. Whereas water celery looks like a highway going through where you have lots of veins into the center, you have a mid vein for your center line, and then you have empty shoulders onto the side. And I'll give you an example, a real life example of what I just said there. So what we see here, this is water celery or vallisneria, also called eelgrass. You can see the center vein or the, the mid vein creating the center line of a highway. Then you can see the cracks and the, the road itself. And then you have the empty shoulders. That this alone. So if you see a plant where the leaves are coming out of the our basil coming out of the sediment and it has the vein patterns like a highway, then you're looking at water celery. Um, here is an example of holding it up towards the sky to see the vein pattern. Moving on to some under, under the sediment features. And so one of them being a rhizome. And so that is a underground stem. So this is not considered a root. Instead, it is a, an underground stem. It's non, not photosynthesis, usually not photosynthesizing. Um, and it's where it's connecting to another growth node that will send something up. And so the question might be, does it have a rhizome? If it has a rhizome, what color is that rhizome? Also, you might be asked to look at the roots. And so, for example, in this plant, they would ask, are the roots segmented? So in this case, yes, indeed, they are segmented. They look like a worm. Um, and some a plant that might be similar to this might have a smooth uh, root. And so there's a way for you to uh, dichotomize uh, those two species. A lot of aquatic plants reproduce asexually through a variety of different um, uh, features, one of them being turions uh, or winter buds. And so these are hardened uh, leaf structures that protect a growth uh, node on the plant in the usually in the fall, and it all the leaves all clump together around a growth node and fall to the bottom. Then they stay on the bottom um, or drift around the lake until conditions are good again, usually in the spring, um, and then they will open up and a new plant will form and it'll be a clone of the parent plant. And so this is a great example of that. So uh, here is a winter bud of, of a bladderwort. And this is what it looks like in the springtime when it was floating around. But this is what it is looking like at the end of the summer and into the fall of the previous year. Here's a bladderwort. There's the plant. And this is the winter bud that is forming. So it looks like these little balls. And they're kind of hard. And they're usually kind of hard compared to the plant itself uh, across different species. So here is curly leaf pondweed. You can see that, that ribbon-like plant with lasagna noodle sides. And if you look carefully, you can see teeth along the edges. Well, this is the winter bud of uh, curly leaf pondweed. And so this structure is really hard. Um, you, you, it'd take quite a bit to crush it in your fingers. And then one more just to show a variety of them. This right here is a winter bud to what's called fries pondweed. What's nice about being aware of the winter buds is sometimes, so fries pondweed can be pretty hard to identify without a winter bud, but this winter bud is specific to that plant. So no other winter bud looks like this. And so then if these are present, you can easily identify it, which is really nice. So that's why it's important to mention uh, winter buds. Some plants don't produce it, um, but some do. And that's helpful for the milfoils, for example. Um, yeah. And I won't talk too much about this, this is going into uh, extreme detail, but I wanted to show this one in particular. So this is called a bulbul. Um, there are macroalgae that grow in the lake. Um, what these are are algae that look like plants. They're, they're big, just like plants. And the uh, common group are the stoneworts. And that uh, is musk that includes musk grass and cara, which is the same thing, Nutella, and it also uh, includes starry stonewort. And this is a picture of starry stonewort. 
and this is its bulbul. So this is a asexual reproductive structure. Uh, it's pretty small, as you can see, here's the fingertip, um, but then it produces this structure that looks like a star. So that's where it gets its name, starry stonewort. The other um, stoneworts out there, the native ones, they do not have star-shaped bulbils. They do have bulbils, but they are perfectly round uh, and not star-shaped. <clears throat> and the other parts, I just want to show that plants do a lot of different things. This is like a potato called a tuber. And these, this whole part, this is a part of a milfoil plant. This is the, the whole flower, also called the inflorescence of the, uh, of the milfoil. And these look like little leaves, but in fact, they're actually part of the flower and it's called a bract. Um, but that's going into a lot of detail um, uh, that we really don't use too much, but is a helpful character for identification. So to conclude this general part, that was a lot of terms um, thrown at you, but it is amazing how you can link just a few of those simple uh, things and then you can get the uh, to the plant relatively quick. But some general tips. So it's always nice to identify fresh specimens. I've had the unlucky uh, job in the past to uh, un oh, have a Ziploc bag that has, is full of aquatic plants that were like a week and a half to two weeks old and they start to become mush and it becomes very difficult to identify. And so identifying the fresh specimens is, is best. Now, if you need to hold on to it, because sometimes you need to bring it back and really look at it a little bit more closely or you want to save it so you can press it. So what we recommend is refrigerate. So it's it's fine to refrigerate a whole bag full of aquatic plants for a couple days, but if you want to keep it for longer, separate out the specific species, put them in a little bit of water into a Ziploc bag and keep it in the uh, refrigerator. Another way that I've found is really nice when it's an individual plant is uh, get kind of a tough paper towel, get that paper towel wet, um, put the plant on the paper towel and fold it over. So there's wet paper towel on both sides of the plant and then put it in a Ziploc bag into the refrigerator. That can actually hold uh, pretty well uh, for a week um, in case you need that time to identify it. So that's a, that's a, a nice way uh, to keep it. Um, when you're trying to ID, collect the entire plant. If possible, if there's flowers and seeds, that, that can be helpful. And uh, beware of plasticity. And what I mean by that is, wow, the same plant species can look different between two lakes and it is frustrating. Um, curly leaf pondweed, for example, we'll just keep using that as an example. I find it early in the season, like really early in the season when ice is getting off and it looks very different. It doesn't, it typically doesn't have the lasagna noodles uh, sides yet. It still has all the other characters, but it doesn't have that wave. And so at quick glance, it could be identified as a incorrectly towards a different species. And so there's a lot of change. Also, um, what could happen is if your lake is um, clear in the spring, but then gets really cloudy with algae or se sediments later in the summer, plants might start to stretch and that might make it look a little different than uh, uh, something in one of the books or in one of the keys. So just be aware that there can be some slight differences. So, and then here's kind of the general format of, of to try to help narrow down. So you can ask yourself the following questions. What plant community did it, did it come from? So if you can remember right, there's the emergent, free floating, where the roots dangle below but aren't attached to the bottom. There's the rooted floating, like the water lilies that are floating leaf but are stuck into the bottom of the lake. And then there are the uh, submersed plants where they mostly are, that most of the plant is below the surface of the water with only maybe certain um, flowers or a leaf maybe floating on the surface. Then ask yourself, what is the leaf arrangement? So are we alternate, are we world, opposite or basal? And am I looking at a simple leaf or a finely divided leaf? These three steps, when you initially find a plant, can really help you narrow it down quickly on what you have. So that concludes our initial uh, overarching 
uh, uh, plant ID part. And then Joe is going to take it from here. Are there any questions so far or anything you'd like me to review and go back to? There are no questions in the chat. So I'm going to switch right. over the screen share here. Perfect. How's that look? Looks good. All right. All right. Well, we'll just keep uh, plowing forward. This is this is the fun part. Now we're actually going to look at some plants. Um, we have um, we're going to start with some of the smaller groups, and then I'll hand it back to Eric for the submerged groups. So you know, he talked about the different um, uh, communities that the plants grow in. So we're going to start with looking at the emergent plants, things like. Um, things like cattails and other things that actually um, emerge above the water surface. So emergent plants aren't um, really where we focus our efforts in this um, CLMP parameter. Um, again, as you can imagine, tossing a rake into a bed of cattails is not a fun opportunity. Um, but sometimes you'll see them growing um, in, in deeper water and you certainly want to uh, document those. So um, we're gonna really quickly, I have one slide here talking about the emergent plants. So um, again, here's cattails. Um, Again, typically you'll be probably growing in, in shallower water or even on land where you're not really gonna be tossing your rake. Um, here along the bottom is something that's pretty commonly seen. Um, hard stem bulrush is a very common um, among the emergent uh, reedy type um, aquatic plants that you're likely to see. Um, and it's, it's fairly easy to distinguish because it has a hard stem. That's the name hard stem bulrush. Um, and then there's a couple of others. You see the, the flowering types here on the, on the upper left of the screen um, that will grow in, in a variety of situations. I've seen them growing in just mud and I've seen them growing in you know, a, foot or, a foot or more of water. And so uh, two of the most common emergent flowering plants that you'll see in that zone is, um, this is Sagittaria, also known as Arrowhead. If you look at those leaves, you can definitely see why it's called that way. Very arrowhead or lanceolate, remember that term, um, leaves that look like a pointed arrow tip. Um, and they will be distinguished by these um, nice white flowers that have three petals and a yellow center. And so that's uh, arrowhead or um, the genus Sagittaria. Um, and then we also often find um, pickerel weed, and that's another um, fairly common one. It has these um, fairly lovely purple um, stalk flowers that um, grow during the summer and they, and they flower through most of the summertime. So if you see them, you're likely to see them in flower. And they too have kind of a, a pointy uh, arrow shaped leaf, but it's a little more heart-like. And you can notice um, also between arrowhead and pickerel weed, um, the veins in the leaves are a bit different. Um, notice on arrowhead how the major veins here on the leaf go up um, towards the point um, at the point of the leaf, but the veins on the side, as you can see, are going out towards the lower points on the leaves. While on um, pickerel weed, you can see all the veins kind of follow the curve of the plant itself. So, um, but typically those flowers will be there to help you, the nice white flowers on arrowhead and especially the purple flowers on, on pickerel weed. Next, we'll look at some of the free floating plants. Um, and these are plants that um, float on the surface, but they're free floating. That means they don't have roots to the bottom of the um, lake that hold them in place. So if you're looking at free floating plants, here's something to ask yourself. Is it smaller than my hand and does it have roots? Um, so um, free floating plants, um, where the plant is, is bigger than your hand, likely indicate it's an invasive species, which we're gonna look at in a minute. Um, and then knowing if there are roots and how many will help you distinguish among the native species of free floating plants. Most of our, our, our native, in fact, all of our native free floating plants are very small. And this frog is a helpful scale in this photo that Eric took of um, some of the tiny little free floating plants that sometimes are actually even, um, confused with algae, um, but they're certainly not. They're, they're um, true leafy plants. 
So here's some of our, our native free floating plants called duckweeds. There's a couple of different um, uh, genera here. Um, they're gonna be smaller than your hand. In fact, often smaller than your fingertip, as you can see here. Um, and so you can see a, a number of them here. You see several on a fingertip here. And, and these um, often will, will just cling to your rake or they may cling to other plants on your rake. But as I mentioned before, they might not attach to your rake at all, but you'll see them. Um, they'll often make uh, kind of cover the whole water surface. And if you flip them over, here's one that's flipped over and it's got a bunch of roots hanging down into um, the water. They don't attached to the bottom, they just float in the water. And if there's multiple roots under the leaf, you know you have the genus Spirodella. It's Spirodella polyrhiza, which actually means multiple roots. Um, common name is large duckweed. But if you flip it over like this one and see that there's only a single root per leaf, then that's the genus Lemna, which is some of our other duckweeds, and there's quite a few of them. And we don't expect you to identify every tiny um, duckweed down to species, but being able to know the difference between Lemna and Spirodella can be useful. So just count those roots as you flip them over. Even smaller is water meal. Look how, you know, this is tiny. See the scale here that says it's one millimeter and it's often mixed in with the duckweeds, but is smaller and it feels mealy if you, you know, rub it between your fingers um, like cornmeal. Um, a fascinating fact about this is that Wolfia, water meal, is the smallest flowering plant in the world. And we have three species right here in Michigan. So that's a, another fun fact for around the dinner table tonight or out on the lake this summer. That's Wolfia or water meal. Now, remember we said, check and see if the plant itself is larger than your hand and it's free floating. If that's the case, you may be looking at European frog bit. And European frog bit is an invasive species that's been popping up more and more frequently in lower peninsula lakes. Um, so, and, and in the upper peninsula. So we really want you to um, keep an eye out for this um, if, you, if you are uh, out doing your surveys. Because it's free floating, it will often drift around in the lake and be found up against the shoreline or, or piled up against cattails and reeds and that kind of thing. Um, but it's a, a free floating rosette with heart shaped leaves that are about the size of a quarter or a, a 50 cent piece. And it'll have a small white uh, flower with three petals. Um, looks to me a little bit like a strawberry flower. And they'll be attached to one another like this. So if you pull up one plant, often you'll get many plants. Here's an example of what I was talking about. This is the small leaves you see here. This is all European frog bit, and it's kind of blown up against um, this cattail. And see how much smaller it is than our lily pads. The lily pads are rooted, they're not free floating, um, but you can definitely see that they, um, for scale, they're a lot smaller um, in size than the lily pads are. So that's European frog bit and our free floating plants. See, we're just flying right along. Um, and so the third category I wanted to talk about is the floating leaf plants that do have roots. And these are things like our water lilies and our water shields. So let me go through those with you. Um, our rooted floating plants include water lilies, water shield, a floating leaf pondweed, and lotus and some others that are, are fairly uncommon. And this is a common scene, right? In a lot of our lakes, you'll, you'll boat along and see a scene like this where you see um, maybe a few different kinds of floating leaf plants. Like I can see right away, here's a leaf that kind of looks like Pac-Man, it's kind of big, but then over here, here's a smaller kind of oval shaped leaf that doesn't have a notch cut out of it at all. And you know, that's probably a different species. So um, let's look a little bit closer. Our lily pads are probably our most well-recognized um, aquatic plants that are rooted and floating. And the two that you're most likely to see are either um, Nufar, which is our yellow flowered water lilies, or Nymphia, which is our white flowered water lilies. Now take a look at those leaf shapes, right? So here's our, here's our Pac-Man leaf, right? You can see it's, it's pretty round and there's sharp lobes here. Here's a sharp corner here, a sharp corner here and a notch. Um, this leaf looks a lot like Pac-Man or maybe a, a pizza pie that someone has taken a piece out of. 
Um, and this is always going to be nymphia. These are your white water lilies. They'll always make these showy white flowers. But now you know how to tell them apart, even if there's no flower at all. This will be your white water lily as compared to the yellow water lilies, which are more oval or football shaped leaf. And look at how the um, lobes are rounded not sharp like the white water lily. It'll still have a notch, which is kind of hard to see with the stem in the way here, but there's a notch in the leaf. Um, and this will make the yellow kind of globe shaped flowers. Um, so yellow water lily, nufar, white water lily, nymphia. Interestingly, we actually have two species of yellow water lily in our uh, lakes in Michigan. Um, the most common is this one, the bull lily, nufar variegata. And the way that you can um, easily tell this from the other species, which I'll show you in a minute, is to feel the stem and maybe look at a cross section. Here we have a cross section of the bull lily stem. It's been cut here. And if you look closely, you can almost imagine you're looking at a bull here with the horns and the head. It's a little, little cow face here. Um, I should probably superimpose a little smiley face on there, but um, you can see that. You can also feel it because this these are ridges along the stem. You can feel it if you just reach under the water and feel the stem. So that's bull lily, nufar variegata. Compared to yellow water lily, nufar advena, they both make the yellow flowers and they look the leaves look quite similar, but look at how advena's stem is nice and round. There's no ridges on it. So you can tell those species apart quite easily. Another feature that you may see um, for Nufar is the dead octopus or the alligators floating in the lake. Um, these are the rhizomes or basically root structure of a Nufar variegata plant that has become uprooted or died and as they float. As they start to decompose, they become buoyant and they float up to the surface. And so people often see these and we'll get calls sometimes or emails, what the heck is this in our lake? Um, these are the roots or rhizomes of um, Nufar variegata, that bull lily. And if you look at them closely, see these scars um, these are where the, the um, petioles, those stems that we showed you um, for the um, new far leaves come off and you can almost see that bull head shape again, right? Um, that's a clue that you're looking at where those stems used to be attached. Here's another common scene as we're out um, looking at our, our lakes. Um, again, look at these leaves. They're not as big as the water lilies and there's no notches. These, these leaves are entire. They're like little footballs or, or ovals. And this is a plant called water shield. Um, and water shield is, is fairly common in our lakes. Um, another common name for it that we just recently learned, especially in the Southern states, they call it snot bonnet, which I think is one of the funniest names for, it, for an aquatic plant. It's called, well, it's called water shield because it looks like a shield, right? That's pretty obvious. It's called snot bonnet because the underside of the leaf, and maybe you can see it here and along the petiole here, um, that leaf stem is covered in like a clear kind of mucilaginous material that feels snotty. It's slippery. It's clear. It feels kind of, it's kind of fun <laughs> actually to play with them. Um, it, it doesn't usually come off on your hands. It kind of stays attached. It's actually protective of the plant against herbivores like insects and other things that want to want to eat the plant and it also keeps the plant hydrated. So here's our water shield or snot bonnet. Another thing to notice is how the petiole attaches right in the center of the leaf, um, not at the edge. It's right in the center and there's no notch or sinus in the leaf. It's, it's an entire leaf with no pie, pie pieces taken out of it. So that's water shield. Now, remember how I noted that the stem is attached, the petiole is attached right at the center of the leaf. Another plant that has a floating, a floating leaf are the pond weeds. Some of the species make a, a, a submerged leaf, but also a floating leaf. And so, but look at how different it is. Look at how the stem is right here at the edge of the leaf, not in the center like water shield would be. So that's a clue that you're not looking at water shield if the stem is way over here on the edge. Um, and it will also have submerged leaves as well in most cases. So again, that's just, some, you'll see potamogetans again, pond weeds when, when Eric goes into that group of submerged plants, but it can trick you occasionally if you're looking at your lily pads and your water shields and you see something else floating. Um, it may be a pond weed. All right. 
I'm going to hand it back over to um, Eric to talk about the submerged plants. Do we have um, any questions at this at this break while we switch over? Yeah, there is one, and it's uh, should we be marking Phragmites in purple loosestrife in the full aquatic plant program? You can, but they're really not included. <laughs> You're welcome to make any notes you want, right? Because remember, um, your this data is primarily for you. Um, but we don't consider them part of the uh, truly aquatic plant community. So if you're interested in surveying them and knowing on your lake where purple loosestrife and phragmites are, those are um, plants that grow on the, on the land around the lake, you're welcome to um, include them. Um, but you don't need to enter them into the MyCore database um, that they're not considered aquatic plants for the purposes of this project. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. And now we're moving right along. Um, you know, again, it's it's when we looked at those other three communities, um, a lot of those simple characters like rhizome, leaf shape, um, all came into play when we were identifying these species. And that moves into further with our submersed plants where we're going to combine leaf arrangement, leaf type, um, if there's a petiole or not, all of those things will be now coming together to learn our submersed plants. Um, just to show you a beautiful underwater picture is that the submersed species are quite diverse. And this is where a bulk of our work will be going on with identification for this, for this parameter. Um, let's see if we can, I, you know, so here's one plant that's water celery. Here's a plant. I think this is going to be bushy pondweed right there. Um, here's a bigger pondweed back here that I can't tell, maybe clasping leaf pondweed. Here's another pondweed right here, maybe variable leaf. So you can see that there's quite a bit going on. Here's a milfoil back here. So there's quite a bit happening uh, just in this tiny uh, viewpoint of this picture. So um, to kind of orient us, um, we broke off uh, different types of different combinations of features and we lumped them together to kind of help uh, organize all these different species. And so I'm going to first look at plants with simple leaves that are opposite world or have alternate leaf arrangement. So when you have a simple leaf and it's alternate and it has a mid vein, you are now looking at a pondweed. So one of the 28 species in Michigan, um, oh, I don't know why there's, there we go. Um, there are two broad groups. So pondweeds can be very easy to identify to species and also very difficult. So some of them are very easy. Like curly leaf pondweed is quite easy because of the teeth. Um, but then there are some that we, put broadly into the narrow leaf or thread-like leaf uh, species, and that can be quite difficult. And in many circumstances, just saying narrow leaf pondweed is, uh, is, uh, will suffice. Even ecological surveys uh, by professionals on lakes will lump them. Otherwise, you'll be spending a very long time on the boat uh, that becomes impractical. Just to think about pondweeds a little bit further to help is that you might be looking at other features called, these are called nodal glands. So here's the stem and here's a leaf coming out and where that leaf touches the stem, sometimes the, depending on the species, it creates these little pimple structures called nodal glands. And if they're present or not, will help determine what species you have. Again, this is only for folks who are really getting into it. Um, we're not asking you to have to look for these because this will require some magnification. Um, but just to show you what, what is needed to identify some of these species. We have to count veins, that's really helpful. Sometimes we look at the types of seeds and what, uh, what do they look like. And then this is the one character that will be looked at and that's called the stipule. So here's a stem, here's this person's finger is on the leaf and they pulled the leaf away from the stem. So they're pulling it away this way. That reveals this kind of papery leaf-like structure and that's called the stipule. So this 
leaf-like structures, some of them are attached right to the stem and separate from the leaf. And some, like in this picture, you can see the stipule is actually fused to the leaf for a portion of it, of the, of the leaf's uh, and stipule's edge. And um, that helps determine what species you have. And here's just a, an, a zoomed out version uh, or a zoomed out look and a zoomed in look. And so this is a uh, large leaf pondweed or Potomagetan ampifolius. Um, you can see even from here that there's some certain characters like these arched uh, leaves that fold up on themselves. Um, they're quite large, um, hence the large leaf pondweed, very alternate on the leaf stem. So, he, you know, leaf here, leaf here, leaf here. So there's alternate leaf arrangement, an obvious mid vein right here. And if you if we look closely, there is a tremendous amount of veins. So if you were to count this, there, there's well over 20 uh, on, on this leaf. And so there's large leaf pondweed. Also, if anyone's an angler uh, here, this is also called pikeweed um, as it's great cover for Northern pikes. So here's a lookalike to the pondweeds, but it's missing one key feature and it's missing the mid vein. So this is a common plant called water stargrass. Um, it also has simple leaves and alternate. And you know, looking at this, you can see kind of ribbon-like uh, leaves, you would easily confuse this with a pondweed, um, especially flat stem pondweed is probably the most uh, closely related to this. But if you look closely at that leaf, there's veins, there's plenty of veins, but no mid vein. Or if there was a mid vein, it would look exactly the same or pretty much the same as all of the parallel veins. So there, so your uh, simple leaf, alternate leaf arrangement, no mid vein you are looking at water stargrass. So there's three characters. Uh, if you're lucky, you do get you, I have seen the flower every once in a while above the water surface and it's quite, quite pretty. How about now simple leaves, but not alternate, but instead world. So again, there's the simple leaf and here's a cross section of the plant. So this is looking at it where we cut and cut and we're now looking overhead at it. Now you can see that all the leaves are coming out of the same uh, same node, and but just in op, in different directions. And so this is considered world. One of the most common simple leaves and world is Elodea. There are two species of Elodea, um, and uh, but both of them have oftentimes three leaves coming out of a whorl sometimes two and sometimes four, but mostly three. Um, you can see this really thick in certain areas or sometimes just scattered amongst the other uh, plants within the plant community. Now there's one plant that we just like to note and that's hydrilla. So hydrilla has never been found in Michigan, but it's been found really close in the Cleveland area and in Northern, uh, North Central Ohio, uh, Indiana. And so it's really close. And this plant is very similar to Elodea and is considered like one of the worst uh, submersed invasive plants in the world. So hopefully we never get it. Um, now this plant, very similar, but what you can see here is that there are teeth on the sides, obvious teeth, teeth on the sides of the leaf. <clears throat> also there are teeth on the, on the mid vein, on the underside of the leaf. So if this is the leaf, here's the mid vein, there's, there's little hooks that come down from it. Also, one more thing is that Elodea mostly has, our native Elodea has three leaves per whorl. Hydrilla will have four or more leaves per whorl. Another uh, simple uh, leaves, and now leaves are in quotes, uh, that are whirled are the stoneworts. So leaves are in quotes because this, this, the stoneworts are not plants at all, and these aren't leaves. This is, these are branchlets coming off of an algae. So this is, a, these are a family of, of algae called macroalgae. So they look like plants, they're large, um, just like plants, but they are algae. And so they lack the structures 
that normal plants do. So this is a decently sized uh, group of plants, uh, a group of macroalgae. They can be quickly divided into Cara um, or Nutella. There are a couple other genera or other groups within, within the family of stoneworts. Cara is the most common and there's a whole bunch of them. And the other name for them are musk grass. They have, why we know mostly about them is because when we scoop them up on our rakes and we start to look at it, it's most of them have a very strong lake smell. They almost smell like lake sediment. Um, I, I don't mind it because it kind of reminds me of summer, but some people can kind of be skunky. Um, there is one prominent member of the stonewort family, and that's called starry stonewort. So that's that uh, plant I mentioned before that has that star-shaped bulbul. And I will, um, I'll, uh, I'll show you a picture of that here uh, in a moment. But I, I want to mention this, these, this family of plants is very important for a lake ecosystem. They provide great habitat for a variety of critters. They create a carpet across the lake so they can uh, across the bottom of the lake and so they can really hold the sediment in place they're producing a lot of oxygen um, which can change the chemistry right at the sediment uh, water interface um, and they're just kind of overall cool and i just took a a little quote uh, that might help just understand the plant a little bit more is it was grayish green coated with lime and smelled like skunk that's cara that's musk grass um, it is this grayish green. It's this coated with lime is referring to when it photosynthesizes, it it changes the chemistry of the water right around the 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 leaf structures, and and calcium carbonate precipitates onto the surface of the plant, and so it becomes gritty um, with this white grayish um, uh, film, and of course smelled like skunk, like I mentioned. So here is a side-by-side -side comparison between starry stonewort and the plant and then Cara, which is the native uh, members of the stonewort family. And so the, the big one with starry is that it has a much bigger reach. It's kind of, it's a stretch, it's very stretched out compared to Cara, which is actually pretty compact. And there we go. And here's uh, now more information on starry stonewort. You can see that a zoomed in version of that bulbul. You can see there's made up of different segments, but looks like a star. You'll find this at the sediment surface or, uh, or below the sediment, just uh, barely below. So when you're raking, so you throw in the rake and you suspect you might have starry stoneward in your lake, um, or if you, you just wanna make sure. So when, there, when that sediment comes up, sometimes you get some sediment in your rake, Take a quick peek at that. Don't just rip it off and throw it in. Try to gently release the mud into the lake and then pull that up and look at that area. Um, what you'll see is these structures called rhizoids. And so that's that clear filament. It looks like fishing line. Um, this is kind of the root-like structures that uh, create these bulbils. Okay, let's move into... Oh, I should mention with Starry Stonewort. And since we're out, the, the important, since, you know, us as a team, we're out there um, looking at the plant community more than anyone this summer will be paying attention to what's going on out there and at the importance of early detection. And so um, finding this plant after it becomes established in a lake, it is very difficult to control. Um, and in many circumstances, it's, it's almost impossible to control once it's established. So if we can find it when it's in a low amount and low abundance, there are many techniques that can hit it hard really quickly and stop or limit its spread before it gets established. And so that's the importance of looking around our boat ramps where this is most likely to enter into our lakes. Okay, so now let's look at plants with simple leaves but with basal leaf arrangement. So uh, there are a handful of species like this. Um, the most common being water celery or Vallisneria americana. And you can see uh, this is me diving in a, a bed of water celery. 
uh, you can see it, it's it's really pretty. Uh, it's a very ribbon like and waves with the wind. Um, it sends up a flower on a stalk that is curly. And so you may have seen this in your lake. Um, and then there, of course, is the pair, the highway veins inside of it. Now, there's a whole other group of basal plants. We're not going to go into detail, but these usually have stiffer leaves and are much smaller. So here's my head and, you know, they're not getting much more than what you see here tall. They actually have sometimes more of a root mass than they do above ground biomass of the plant. And so we have quill warts and pipe warts are our, uh, our most common um, group or uh, species within this type of plant. Um, quill wart is actually not a, a flowering plant at all. And it has little spores that grow inside the base of the leaf. And then we have pipe wart, which has um, uh, worm-like or segmented roots. And this will actually send up a flower in the shallow, in shallower water. And it looks like a little button, a white button. You'll find these um, more on our northern lakes and ones that are soft water, uh, meaning they don't have a lot of solutes in them. So here's that picture of water celery. Um, there's the highway veins all coming from one spot near the sediment surface with the, uh, the flower stock going up in a spiral type way. Um, just because it's fun, and I like saying this word, is so this, this structure right here, the flower stock, is called the peduncle. And I just love saying that, peduncle. Eric, I've got a question in the, in the chat for you here. Yeah. Um, do naiad and starry stonewort look similar? Um, no. And that's one plant we don't talk about uh, in this. Is So naiads are a group of species, like four species, two being fairly common. Um, they're going to be pretty compact. The, the, it's, they might be branching a lot, but the leaves coming out of the stem are quite compact more like Elodea. And a starry stonewort will have much lengthier branchlets coming off of the main stem. Also another character that I didn't mention for starry stonewort is that um, you can pop it. So if there's a bunch of branchlets coming out of one node and then there's a bunch of branchlets coming out of another, the stem that is connecting the two, you can squeeze it, you can feel it pop and all of the it's like cytoplasm, all, all of the contents of that cell will pour out of it. Um, that's a great character to tell between starry stonewort and the naiads, which are a flowering plant that if you squeezed the stem, you would just be squeezing and smushing the stem. Joe, great. do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's great. And I just put in the chat a link to a photo of, of slender naiads so people can see what uh, Peggy was asking about. Yeah, and I think you know, it would be, so the two common naiads would be bushy pondweed, which I think is slender, slender naiad. The yes. common names are tough because you know, they, they're different. And then southern naiad as well. So those are the two common naiads that you might encounter. All right, thank you. Now plants with finely divided leaves to kind of uh, finish us off for today. Look at the time. Perfect. So finely divided leaves come in a variety of char a variety of characteristics. Um, key ones to take a look at are, are they feathery or are they branched leaves? How are they positioned on the stem? What is their leaf arrangement? And are bladders present? And you can kind of see this looks like a milfoil leaf, right? And they're all coming out of that. We're looking at forking, not so much looking like a feather like the milfoils. Um, this looks like forking, but many, many times. Also, here's an example with circles around it. So here's a leaf with a petiole, and here's another petiole, and this is alternate leaf arrangement you can see there. And then, of course, you can look at these little bladders that are formed. So looking at probably the most common um, finely divided plant we'll find are is coontail. So Coontail gets its 
name because when it comes out of the water and you can see this kind of looks like a raccoon tail um, at the tip of the plant. This plant is actually free floating. It doesn't root. Um, it might be lying on the bottom. It might be floating on the top or it might be neutrally buoyant somewhere in the water column. Um, so it, 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 you're, you won't be pulling up roots with this plant. Um, it's forked like I mentioned, and here's a good look at it. So here's another way it looks. So it has less of that coon, coon tail look. Um, but when you look at a, a cross section, so let's zoom into it right here, it's forking once. So this is one leaf right there, and it's forking once. Um, and this is an important one to, to remember. It does kind of change forms a little bit, but it will always have just the forking once or twice. And if you look closely, you can see little teeth on there too. So there's a little serrated edge. Um, probably our most common plant, common submersed plants across the state. So now let's look into other species to kind of see the, the difference uh, between coontail and, and others. So of course we have to talk about the milfoils. So the milfoils aren't forked. You know, this is one leaf and these are the leaflets coming out. We have eight species in Michigan, six of them being native. Um, and those six native ones are pretty awesome. You know, I have, here's the quote from uh, through the looking glass that Joe mentioned uh, that the book from UW was uh, University of Wisconsin extension. And just to kind of orient you to like, if you get to put on a snorkel mask and look below the surface, what these milfoils can look like. So the feathery stems of Northern water milfoil rose from the soft bottom like spires on a Gothic cathedral. Um, and I think that's, that's accurate. You know, it's a pretty cool uh, uh, look when they are coming up more singularly through, through maybe the cara that you see here. Now, of course we have a invasive milfoil, Eurasian water milfoil, and do I go through? Yes, Joe will be talking about how to identify uh, Eurasian uh, milfoil specifically. So some milfoil ID tips is look for the leaf arrangement. Some of them uh, look very similar, but instead of being whirled around the uh, leaf, uh, around the stem, they're scattered around and kind of looks more like a tilt-a-whirl, you know, that, um, that, um, fair ride where it's kind of tilted and you're going all around it they more look like that than a clean whirl look at the leaflet numbers so spend time to count how many leaflets are on one side of the the, the center of the the leaf look at stem color so is it green is it white or is it dark brown and bracts uh, those are referring to uh, this flower structure and then also it's important, this is really helpful at first, is the habit. So look at the picture on the left, look at the picture on the right. These are both milfoils and habit is referring to kind of just the general shape. So this is Eurasian water milfoil and this is often what it looks like. And this is variable leaf milfoil, a native milfoil. And you can see this looks more like a pipe cleaner, very thick, um, many leaves on the stem compared to Eurasian milfoil. Um, continuing on, looking at finely divided, but more of the branched um, and then alternate. So we're looking at forked many times, which is called branched and alternate on the leaf uh, or on the stem. And so this isn't the best of pictures, but it's a, and we'll be seeing these flower here soon. They, they flower early. They have a nice white flower um, that pokes above the water surface. But what you can see here, and this is the best example, is here's the leaf and here's the leaf. So you can see that they are alternate on the stem. Um, also note that this has a pretty big petiole. So it has a leaf stock um, where there are some that, that do not. And of course with bladder warts, um, they are branched and alternate, but you can separate them because they have bladders. And uh, we have a handful of species of bladderworts uh, in the state. Uh, some of them are kind of are pretty hard to I identify uh, or separate, um, but some of them are really easy as well. This is common bladderwort, which is very common. Um, this is our biggest one in the in the state. Um, 
as you pull it up, the leaves are clasp, collapsing in on themselves, but you can look at these dark bladders and there's the bladder, that's the bladder part of bladderwort. And here's that beautiful um, flower. This is a zoomed in picture of just one leaf. So that's one leaf. The stem would be right here. And then I just wanted to show you with some, what the diversity is out there. We have a purple bladderwort. And this one is actually whirled around the stem. As you can see all the, the large amount of bladders there. Going to finely divided but and branched but opposite. So now we have our native uh, Biden's Beckii, so water marigold. These almost look whirled, um, but what's happening here is this is one leaf here and this is one leaf here. So it looks whirled, but these are opposite. Um, you can see there's really no petiole. Compared, if you're in the southwest part of the state or the southern part of the state, there's an, a more common invasive plant called kabamba or fanwort. And this is op branched and opposite, but they have this petiole. So they have that petiole. So it's amazing, you know, just with these sm small handful of characters, we can quickly separate what's invasive and, and what is not. And that moves us to our next part where Joe will talk about the uh, invasive, uh, our established invasive plants in the state. Thank you, Eric. This is kind of our, our last little bit for you. So we just wanted to um, take the time to emphasize a few of the important um, invasives that we have uh, that um, we definitely wanna make sure that you're um, looking for and reporting. And in fact, if you find invasive species, you know the, the reporting um, deadline that we talked about before was the end of October. But if you find an invasive, especially one that you don't think is known from your lake, um, previously. Um, let us know right away. Yeah, don't wait till October. Um, we can help make sure that um, the uh, that that you are able to respond to that uh, invasion and that if it's a high priority new invasive species like the frog bit that we talked about that um, the state is notified as well um, because there are resources to help control it. But I wanted to just wrap up today with um, a quick review. You've seen all three of these plants already this morning, um, but I want to, you know, kind of drive home um, the identification for Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and starry stonewort. These are the three established aquatic invasive plants in our, um, our uh, Mich Michigan's inland lakes. So Eurasian water milfoil, um, we definitely have, have seen these um, finely divided leaves um, and feather-like leaves that are common to all of our milfoils in Michigan, whether they're native or invasive. But what you're looking for with Eurasian water milfoil is that you'll find the leaves will have 12 to 21 pair of leaflets. So um, we're talking about counting the pairs of leaflets along the stem here. Um, and seeing a lot of them kind of closely spaced, not spread out far. Um, a couple of other things that you're likely to see with your Asian milfoil is that the leaves will be limp when you pull the plant up out of the water. The leaves will collapse along the stem. Most of our native milfoils are much stiffer leaved. And so you pull them out and they'll stay kind of rigid and away from the stem, but uh, your Asian milfoil will collapse. Um, the stem tends to be pinkish, although not always, um, but if you see a pinkish stem, um, that is also a clue that you're probably dealing with Eurasian water milfoil. Now, one thing that we're seeing more and more, and maybe you've heard about this, is that Eurasian water milfoil is in some lakes um, crossing with native northern milfoil and making a hybrid water milfoil. And those hybrid water milfoils are very tricky to identify um, from appearance alone um, because they tend to have intermediate characteristics. They might have you know, 12 pair of leaflets on some leaves, maybe only 10 on others, they may be kind of limp, but not very limp. They may have the pink stem, they might not. And really um, the only 
reliable way to determine whether you have a hybrid milfoil in your lake is to have it genetically tested. If you're interested in having genetic testing done on the milfoil in your lake, talk to us. Um, we have resources that may be able to allow you to have that testing done um, at a reasonable cost. It's particularly important if you're thinking about having um, your water milfoil um, managed with herbicide um, because some of the hybrid strains are not susceptible. They are resistant to the herbicides that um, are effective against Eurasian water milfoil. So before you apply herbicides and you're working with a consultant to do that, um, you may want to talk to them about having your milfoil genetically tested. The second invasive that we want to revisit is curly leaf pondweed. Um, this has actually been, as it says at the bottom of the slide, it's been in North America since the 1800s. Um, it was actually introduced intentionally to create fish habitat in some of our lakes. Um, and it um, grows pretty early in the season, so you can keep an eye out for it now. Um, into June and early July. Um, that's one of the ways that it becomes very successful as an invader is it starts growing before the native plants do and can get a, get a stronghold in your lake before the native plants have a chance to. Um, like all the potamogetans, it has simple leaves with an obvious mid vein. You can see that mid vein here in the picture. Um, the leaves are arranged alternately on the stem. That's true for all of our potamogetans, but you know that it's um, curly leaf pondweed when you see those serrations along the edges of the leaves. And of course that um, distinctive lasagna noodle appearance. Now, sometimes if you find a plant that is very old or very young, it might not be as lasagna looking. Um, or if it's pressed, if someone pressed a sample for you to look at, you won't get to look at those lasagna shape um, leaves, but you still will see those serrations. So that's the dead giveaway. It's the only potamogeton, the only pondweed in Michigan that would have teeth or serrations on the edges of the leaves. And then finally, um, starry stonewort. Um, again, this is one that we, it seems to be kind of marching its way north. Um, in Michigan's lakes and is one that is, uh, we really don't have a good handle on how to eradicate it once it becomes established. So early detection is really important. Um, you know, we have a, a colleague on a lake near Lansing that has watched um, his, his, does a aquatic plant survey through the CLMP every year on his lake and has watched starry stonewort expand from being at about 10% of the sites on his lake to over 85% of the sites on his lake, um, lake-wide, and that's only in about three or four years. So it can really spread quickly. So again, look for those white bulbs that look like stars. That's kind of the dead giveaway. Nothing else is going to make those stars. Um, they're usually down um, on the underside of the plant or even uh, along the sediment um, lake bottom. Um, or in the lake bottom a little bit, um, attached to those clear rhizoids that look like fishing line. Um, and um, it will, as Eric said, it will pop in your hand if you squeeze it when he was comparing it to Naya due to Peggy's question. It's brittle, it will break apart in your hand. And another important point that's, that's brought up here that I'll emphasize, um, it overall just looks tangled and kind of unkempt when you pull it out. A lot of the native stoneworks look fairly orderly. Um, this is a mess when you pull it out. You can kind of see that. And even this plant, it looks kind of messy. And the branchlets are, will be of uneven length. So look at this one. It's branched into two and one is longer than the other. And I'll show you another um, underwater image that shows this really well. Um, look at how the branchlets are of uneven length. Our native cara, the other muskgrass and stuff that we see a lot, um, is very orderly and the branchlets will be of even length. So we encourage you to really make sure you familiarize yourself with the aquatic invaders um, so you can report them um, locally and to us um, as soon as you potentially suspect you have them. Um, this is a handout from the state of Michigan that um, we distribute, um, and also you can get it at most of your, your um, DNR offices and so forth. It um, shows these, what, what the state calls their watch list of aquatic invasive plants. And so these are ones that have not yet really established in our waters. So not Eurasian milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, or starry stonewort, but here you can see frog bit, you can see hydrilla, 
um, you know, we have European frogbit in Michigan. We don't have hydrilla yet, but there's some other plants like yellow floating heart that has been found in a few isolated locations in Michigan and so forth. So these are all kind of the state's highest priority that they call the watch list that they really want to hear about soon. So if you find any of these or suspect you have them, let us know. We can help make sure, you know, we get a, a true identification of it and then report it to the state if necessary, because um, there is support available to help manage them if they are found. All right, well, we don't want to leave you on the like bummer note of invasive species. So again, we wanted to, to kind of swing back to the idea of this underwater forest. It's absolutely lovely. Our lakes are full of amazing native species, a whole diversity of them that fish and invertebrates and crayfish and other species find home and is what really a large part of what makes our, our lakes healthy. And so we're really thrilled that you've all, you know, chosen to monitor the plants in the lakes that you care about. Um, because, you know, I love this quote, you may have heard it before, but in the end, we'll only conserve what we love, we'll only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. So we're really glad that you're on this journey, you're learning about aquatic plants, you're going to get out there and, and experience them for yourself. If you get a chance, put a snorkel mask on and go in and look at them um, in their habitat instead of pulling them up out of the water, because that's a really amazing way to appreciate them as well. So with that, um, we have a few minutes for questions and we'd be happy to um, address any questions that are in the chat or if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions, um, we'll be happy to, to chat with you now. And Joe, one came in, so I'll, I'll ask that. Are there any good distinguishing characteristics of Potomogeton pectinatus? So Stuchinia pectinata, which is sago pondweed, so Joe, you, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, um, so sago pond weeds. Um, as as Eric mentioned, he kind of updated your your um, Latin for that one. Um, it's it's a um, it's it's a pond weed, but it's in a different genus. It's not Potomogeton. It's in um, Stachynia. And um, again, you'll still see the alternate leaves. You'll see, um, you know, kind of that, that similar structure of leaves arranged along a stem, but the leaves are very thin, like needle-like. Um, and they will also, along the base of that leaf, um, be kind of clasping or wrapped around the stem. And if you take the leaf and the stem, you'll be able to kind of pull it away and you'll watch it separate and that clasping area will separate. And then finally for sago pond weed, it has super sharp leaf tips. Like it looks super pointy. And so you'll see kind of this very thin, but um, almost bushy looking plant with super sharp leaf tips. And you can pull the leaf away from the stem and it will kind of um, unclasp as you do it. So that's what I look for um, with sago pond weed. Any other questions, feel free to ask away. If you have a picture of a plant you would like to share with us, we can help identify it right now. We do that a lot, like don't hesitate during the course of the summer. If you have plants that you're not sure about, um, shoot us photos and we'll identify them as best we can, especially if you follow those photo tips, like making sure that it has a scale and it shows us, you know, the features that we need to see, leaf arrangement, leaflets, if it's a milfoil, things like that. And oh my gosh, if you can get a flower, then you're, then you're golden, but um, flowers are usually pretty, pretty short lived on our aquatic plants. And I'll, I have a, uh, another presentation up that had some sago pond weed that I can share real quick. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Are you seeing this? Okay. Just in PowerPoint, PowerPoint mode. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. That's no problem. So um, here's a zoomed in <clears throat> image of what Joe was talking about where the, so the stipule here. So here's the stem, here's the stipule and here's the leaf and the leaf and the stipule are fused for a huge part of this, the length of the stipule. <laughs> I know I just use stipule a ton in this, in like two sentences, <laughs> but that's, that's the leaf coming out. And so Joe was talking about pulling it apart. And so if you can imagine like my finger, right, my fingers right here, pulling the leaf away from the stem, this is what will pop off. And then you can look at the tip of the, so sago pondu is very fine, um, very thin leaf and very pointy. And then when it's on the surface, 
when it's uh, in a very nutrient rich lake, it can create this um, very thick canopy on the top. I'll make another um, just kind of mention of the um, of the uh, side by side the field visits that we're going to plan with you. Um, we have quite a few new lakes in the program this year, and so we're going to be reaching out to each of you individually. Probably start it with an email just to kind of you know remind you of what we're planning to do and what the day will be like, and to start the planning process with you. Um, so if there's you know start thinking for yourself what dates will work well for you because you'll hear from us in the next week or so on that. Um, if you're an experienced lake and want to, you know, could use a refresher or interested in that, um, contact us because um, we'll assume you're good unless we hear from you because um, many of you have experience doing this if, you, if this is your second or later year for this program. Um, and I'll mention also, like for those of you who are first, you know, this isn't necessarily something that lakes do every year because it's a, it's a fair amount of work. Um, and so, you know, you are welcome. You know, a lot of our lakes that repeat it will repeat it after three or four years, you know, or something like that. Um, not necessarily say, okay, we have to do this every single year. Um, lakes that do want to do it every year, year, um, you certainly can. Um, and it's maybe protect, particularly useful for lakes that are changing, right? If plants are being managed or something is changing on your lake where you suspect, I think my lake, you know, my plant community is changing on this lake and we want to track it on an annual basis. You certainly can, but you're not required to do so. You, that's a, that for your choice, how, however frequently you want to do it. All right, well, I'm not seeing any more um, uh, questions in the chat right now. I'm super proud of us for ending on time. Yeah. Um, we always worry, you know, we get excited about plants and we wanna talk and talk and tell you about it, but we tried really hard to, to be on schedule this time for you out of respect for your time and, and our voices probably a little bit too. Um, so it's recorded, um, give us a week or so to get it up on the MyCore website. Um, and once it's there, you can watch it whenever you want. You can fast forward to the ID part if you have questions about that and want to review that. Um, you can also share it, share the link with anybody else on your lake who might be curious or interested in helping you out. Um, it'll give them a chance to kind of get up to speed on things as well. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Yep. We look forward to, we look forward to coming out on your lakes. Um, this is one of the favorite things and we haven't been able to do it for a couple of years. So we're really, really looking forward to that and getting out on the lakes with folks and, and, uh, you know, seeing your plants, seeing your lakes and, and seeing you. Um, that's, that's a big part of this program as well. So I think we're going to wrap up. Thanks again, everyone. If you think of a question later, feel free to shoot us an email or give us a call and we'll respond as soon as we can. Thanks a lot. <laughs>